<laughs> so I'm here with Pepsi Watson. Served 13 years in the UK prison system. I get asked so much by people on YouTube, what's the UK prison system like, that experience versus the US experience that I had and other people have had. I mean, most of the people watching my videos on YouTube are out of America. So they're intrigued by this UK experience. So Pepsi is worth my activism. My books is on YouTube now with the Crime and Justice TV channel. He's only just set it up, so he's got no subs. We will put the description in the box, a link in the box, the description box below this video for you if you want to click over to that. And his blog is the IPP Diaries. So Pepsi reached out to me. So, so I watched his stuff on YouTube, other things that have been posted. And I just think that he's a, a brilliant natural speaker. He's got a book in him himself. Um, he could be an interviewer, he could do his own podcast. And a lot of the English guys, their accents are a bit strange. Even people complain about Wildman. Um, but I think the Americans are going to really understand what, what Pepsi here is saying. So before we get into your backstory then, Pepsi, on, on the drive up here, you were giving, giving a little details about this prison for young offenders. You had an experience in there. What what went down? And can you describe what it's like going into that like UK prison? Um, so, yeah, the... <clears throat> The prison that I was talking about is a young offenders institution. It's called Aylesbury Young Offenders Institution in Buckinghamshire. Um, it has got a fierce reputation in the young offenders institution estate. Um, it's for long term young offenders um, between the ages of 18 and 21. Mm -hmm. uh, the worst crimes committed by uh, young men that age that you see in the mainstream media they will end up in Aylesbury. There is a couple of other sort of long-term young offenders institutions like Moreland, Swinford Hall, but Aylesbury is 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 the main um, one where they'll end up. And troublesome young prisoners can end up going there. What the, was it like for you actually going in? The day, I, well, the day that I got told I was going to Aylesbury, I remember I was in Norwich prison. I'd got four years uh, for a robbery. And um, I remember when they came to me, they pulled me out of education uh, and they said, you've been transferred. And I was like, okay, no problem. And as we were walking down the the, the sort of landing uh, back to my cell, I said, where, I said to the officer, where am I going? And he said, you're going to Aylesbury. And as soon as that word came out of his mouth, I was just struck with this fear. Um, I went into my cell. Um, the officer shut the door, I barricaded the door up. I, I said, I'm not going. And the, all the mediators were at my door and they said, you are going to Aylesbury. You are going the easy way or the hard way. And when you refuse a transfer, they'll uh, jack the door. They'll come in, twist you up, cuff you. Um, and then they'll bend you over like that and put you on the van. And they, they put me on the bus. Did that happen to you? No, I, I, he gave me some tobacco under the door and I agreed because <laughs> I knew that they would get me out of there in the end. So I, I he, he gave me the tobacco. I took the tobacco. Um, this was in 2000, 2000, 2000. Yeah, I was 18. Uh -huh. You were 18, okay. Yeah, and um, I can't really remember the journey there, but I remember being terrified going to Aylesbury. I remember getting there um, and just seeing this, this sort of, old gray dark building and going through the gates um pulled up got off the bus walked into reception and the officer said have you heard about Aylesbury I said yeah and he said uh well, it's not as bad as everyone says that's what he said to me and uh they put me on the induction wing um and then they put me onto the main wing so in Aylesbury what they do you've got a wing where all the white boys the white guys are and the gypsy travelers and then on b wing it's all the black boys and then when you when you if you get into any trouble or piss off the officers then they put you onto the other wing right um all right so let's just go back a, a sec because you jumped ahead there so you said you were in duck in induction first mm -hmm. so for these american viewers you know a lot of them never even been to any prison in their lives what is it like, a UK induction? What does that even mean? Um, well, it's a bit of a farce, really. It depends. It varies from prison to prison. But generally, an in, the induction process would involve seeing the prison chaplain, um, seeing the education department, 
maybe seeing a personal officer, um, being told about the canteen, um, and just visits, general stuff like that. So you got like fill out a questionnaire, that kind of process. Like my religion is this, my my diet is this, my yeah. medical situation is this. Yeah, all well, that kind of stuff is is dealt with. Yeah, um, and then once you're inducted, you move on to a main wing. Okay. So go on then. What what happens on this main wing? How's that? What's it? What what does the main wing look like? Victorian, draconian, old. Um, they put me onto B wing. Uh, there was I honestly can't remember more than two or three white lads on there. It yeah. was all black lads. They put me straight onto that wing. When you walk onto the wing, all you can hear is rap music, mainly rap music. Mm -hmm. You'll have <clears throat> most guys will have a stereo. Um, so like where I was housed, <clears throat> you know, if you had rap music on, you got your Walkman and you got your headset so no one else can hear it. Right. Even with your TV in America, in the prison, you got a headset plugged into your TV. It's like this clear tech TV. Mm. It's, it's this plastic that you can see right inside it so no one can hide anything in it. Yeah. So are you saying in the UK system, everyone's just going around with music blurring? Yeah, it, it was wow, always that's noisy. that's going problems. All night, all day, um, everyone playing music. Um, not all just rap. You have people playing garage, jungle, reggae. Yeah. Um, but because you, you, you just you banged up so much, um, music is something that, that people um, use to kill the time. Yeah, yeah, and, and I understand <clears throat> that. But does that cause fights? Like, say, like, or is there a certain time everyone says, like, I was in one prison where... 10 10 was the rule mm. from 10 10 you don't make any noise or you get or you get smashed as soon as those cell doors open in the morning if you're being loud at night jumping around banging and, and things 10 10 rule doors open in the morning your racial gang is going to smash you uh -huh. so was there like etiquette as to when you could people could be playing this music or was it just going all night long um in Aylesbury, generally people would just play their music whenever they wanted but depending on what cell you're in um, you can upset someone with your music 100%. Yeah, like that. You, you can 100% upset someone. Um, it's it, emotions are high, people are angry, people are young, full of energy, um, locked up. And if someone's trying to sleep, and um, you know, they'll bang the wall or the ceiling and they'll say, Turn it down. Yeah, the person alive then has a decision to say, All right, or no and carry on and then it'll, there'll be a fight in the morning yeah i see so if you don't turn it down so how many people are in a cell just one in Aylesbury. oh that's good at least so you're not like if you've got a cellmate who's into classical and you're into rap there's obviously going to be a fight there <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> so all right so the mood you're arriving the music's blurring mm. you're thinking what am i getting into here what what happens next just a really intense environment. You have to have eyes in the back of your head. In young offenders institutions like long-term young offenders institutions like Aylesbury, you're not allowed in each other's cells. So all the fights no happen. No cell visiting. No, you're not allowed. Okay. In, nobody's allowed in each other's cells. So all yep. the fights happen at lunchtime, tea time, yep. in the showers, and, 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 yeah. and on association. Um, as soon as the doors open, um it just goes off yeah um the officers stand there in groups of five six seven eight of them with earpieces and chewing gum and they just stand there and so as soon as the doors open it goes off what do you mean by it goes off just arguments from the night before people arguing about um islam people arguing um just arguing out the window about uh, stupid things um, there's always issues What's going on. What's the age on. range of these prisoners then? 18 to 21. Oh, so it's like gladiator school then. 18 to 21, full of energy, full of testosterone, all doing press-ups all, all day and night yeah. uh, on the creatine, yeah. uh, eating tuna, eating mash, just getting as big as they can. Um, and I mean, yeah, massive units, 18, 19 year old lads, just massive, massive units. Um, Did they get steroids smuggled in? Um, probably now, but I mean, this was 2000 it, it, at that time. It was mainly cannabis. It was mainly cannabis, hash, sometimes a bit of weed. No heroin and spice. Not then. No, okay. Not then. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, the officers would run a regime of fear and brutality. If, as soon as you walked out your door at lunch and tea, they would just be eyeballing you. And they would just bark at you, keep on moving, away from doors, 
tuck your fucking shirt in, two bits of bread per man. Um, and if you said anything to them or looked at them the wrong way or mouthed off to them, they would let you get your dinner, wait till you banged up, and they would all come up to your cell, all of them, and they just don't mess around it. They just take the radio off and, and come in. All right, so let's wind the clock back on this first day in this young offender's prison. So you've described brilliantly going in. Mm. You've described the doors pop open in the morning. There's been arguments in the night, maybe over music, maybe over other things. So people are settling their beefs now and the guards are all lined up, you know, ready for action. How are you feeling at this point in time as you come out into this chaos, psychologically? Uh, just terrified, really. I was 18 years old. I spent, um, already spent time from the ages of 14 to 18 in lots of other young offenders institutions. We're gonna but get to that, yeah. This place was just a totally different ball game. Um, it was so intense, the feeling in there. Um, and you, you, yeah, you're just, I was just terrified, scared. I'd heard all these horror stories about the place and it was, like I'd heard it was uh, so you're, violent. You're coming out for breakfast, I take it, around this time. Y yeah, you come out, um, you come out, um, was there breakfast then? It might, I think, that, yeah, there was still breakfast then. Maybe, maybe and you on the don't weekends. know anybody? Don't know anybody there. Most people are in that prison are from London, um, Hackney, Tottenham, um, the, the, the predominantly young black areas, Moss Side, Manchester. So did anyone sweat you as you come out for your breakfast on this morning when people- You get, you get tested straight away. Um, you know, people come in. You, when, you arrive, when, when you arrive in that cell, people are banging the wall straight away and say, bring your toiletries out at dinner. And you don't even know who it is. Bring, bring your stereo out at dinner or um, tea or um so and so or this person from three doors down uh he said bring your and it, it's not it, it, no one's polite it's like come to your fucking window that's how that's how you're spoken to um so you're tested immediately you're tested immediately and you have to fight if you don't fight you you, you you'll be a victim for the rest of your sentence you have to fight you have to come out so what was your fight. first major challenge when these guys are testing you on this first day um there was there was two guys that were there um who I'd been fighting with in Norwich my friend threw hot water over him um and they attacked me in the showers with a knife this is this is in this new one that you got This was to, in yeah. Norwich oh, this is in Norwich two okay. two young lads from London yeah. um yeah attacked me with a knife in the showers when I was naked I'm um, trying to cut my face um and, and what what was that over that was over uh, a at Norwich, there was a fence and people used to throw like cannabis over yeah. and we used to hook it up and I hooked it, hooked it up. My friend threw it over and then these guys at the window saying, send it to us. What did they have to do with it? N nothing. They were just <laughs> trying to grab yeah. it. Yeah, because I got it in the window and then I was sent breaking bits of hash off and sending lines to people, yeah. to my friends. And then, they, and then again, like I said, like, um, not polite, threatening. What, what, you think you can send everyone um, bits of hash and not send us? And I was like, yeah. And then that's that's when it escalated. Uh, my friend waited on the stairs, threw hot water over one of them, and it went all over his neck. Boiling water. Boiling water. All his skin went pink, all just peeled off. Um, and I remember on the induction wing, I was walking and I looked up and they were both there. They were both there. And one of them went onto my wing and one of them went onto another wing. And um, I was... I, I saw him and as soon as I saw him, I was just like, oh no. Um, and he's eyeballing me, intimidating me. Um, and and it, nothing happened in the end, but that was that was kind of my first uh, challenge um, with, with someone. Um, so yeah. this is your enemy from the other prison yeah. is eyeballing you. Yeah. Just going back to the other prison story a minute. So I just want to make the, get this a bit clearer for the, the people watching this. So you were bringing in the weed. These guys had a sense of entitlement. Mm. Next thing, you're drawing first blood, actually, because your mate is throwing boiling water on his face. Yeah. Is that because you thought these guys were going to attack you, you guys? Well, yeah, you have to attack first. In, in, in young offenders institutions, because yeah. it's not in the cells, it's all on the landing. 
and it will be 10 seconds. You've got basically 10 seconds before the officers wow. jump on you. So in that, even less, five yeah. seconds, um, yeah. because the officers are normally there. Um, so it's always on the stairs or in little dark corners or on the exercise yard or at the pool table. And you've got 10 seconds to um, attack somebody before they will attack you. Um, so you have to, by that time, even though I was only 18, I'd already had years of experience in young offenders institutions mm -hmm. and um, and I'd just learned um, over those years that you have to, so my friend made the decision to at attack them first. Did you know he'd made that decision? Um, yeah, yeah, because I remember him waiting on the stairs at dinner. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's like when you say in American prisons, when someone, if, when someone calls you a bitch, yeah. you have to fight. In the young offenders institutions, they will cuss your mum. And when they cuss your mum, if you don't go and attack them, then you'll be a victim for the rest of your sentence. Yeah, so I understand. Yeah. So the threats will happen at night out the window. So that with that situation, um, they'll. He said like it's on then. It's on. So when someone says it's on. And then they just shut the window. Yeah, you can't go back to the window and go, "Oh, please, mate. Um, you know, oh, let's sort this out." Because everyone will just laugh at you, and then yeah. you'll be a victim. So as soon as someone says it's on, then you have to fight, and you you can either wait for them to attack you, or you have to go, you know, you or you have to attack them before they attack you. And when you attack them, it's got to be quick bloody when you're talking about the metal trays mm -hmm. in the american prisons um we had them in the young offenders institutions people would have them smashed around their heads i've seen people pick up the hot whole hot water urn and throw that at people um and it's very quick very sudden um and you you've just got to try and beat somebody in a few seconds um before before they can do anything to you in 10 seconds because it's such a short period of time. In the adult prisons, you go in the cell and shut the door and yeah. fight for 10 minutes yeah. and no one's coming to help you. Totally different. But in the young offenders, it's in in front of um, everybody. Um, I'm really glad you've explained that because people are really interested in the psychology of prison violence and you've really detailed the mentality of the young offenders. It is like a gladiator school. In, in some of these prisons. So we've we've, we've took a, a sidetrack now to the first day at this other prison story, which we were on. So let me just recap then. So you get to this this, this prison, um, people are challenging people, the guards are just waiting for something to happen. Now you've got an enemy there mm. that was the partner of the guy who your partner yeah. threw boiling water on his face. Yeah. So this guy's check, checking you out, but there's not, Nothing's kicking off. No, it never, it never kicked off. Um, I did see him in the showers. What used to happen in the showers is on B-Wing in the showers, there were stairs going down. And when you stood at the top of the stairs, all you would see is steam. That's all you would see is steam. <laughs> and there's no prison officers down there. They'd be upstairs near the pool tables. And you'd walk down into this steam and there'd be a tiny little bench, enough for really just one person to put their stuff really. And there'd be three showers and you'd walk in shower and then four black guys would just turn up and say move your fucking stuff off the bench that's what they'd say to you and if you said no they're just going to throw it in the water yeah then you're going to say what you're doing mm -hmm. um and he came in um i still remember i still remember his face there's two there's one tall he was on the other wing and then this one and he come in um and he was saying you jugged my mate you jugged my mate and i said it wasn't it wasn't my mate um, and nothing, nothing happens. Sometimes things just fizzle out. Um, yeah, yeah. Sometimes things get squashed, um, so, and you, you'll make an agreement. So mm -hmm. it's it squashed. Yeah. Um, so these were black guys. Black guys. Yeah. Okay. So where I was housed, then the race that had the most numbers picked on the race with the least. Mm. So if you know if it was the Mexican Americans or the Mexicans and they were the most, or if it was the whites and they were the most, the blacks were the least, whatever. So you're saying that you were the minority in this prison, it was majority black. On that wing. So yeah. they tend to victimize the race that's the least. That's that's not a racist thing. That's just how it works in prison. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So this beef has kind of been fizzling out now, squashed over the water incident with your, your, your partner at the other prison. What's your next challenge at this place? 
Um, the next challenge at that place was just immediately with the prison officers. Okay. Um, they j take it upon themselves and they they grind you down psychologically. Yeah. They taunt you. Um, they have bets on trying to get prisoners to kill themselves. Kill themselves. Um, which has been proven in Feltham. That came out a few years ago. Well, what what methods do they use to encourage? prisoners to kill themselves what they were doing to me in Aylesbury in the morning they would come in at eight o'clock and they would put a milk in on the side um and on the I'd, side of what on the side of the table they'd come in open a door um and they put the milk on the side and then so you're in a, you're in a let's, let's just um start with a minute you're in a one-man cell you said earlier mm. so i imagine it's like the size of a bus stop shelter or less yeah and you've got your bunk on one side and it's the standard combination sink toilet with a little stool table. Yeah, like um, a little stool, a chair, um, a... Is it all bolted down, silver? All bolted yeah, down. so it's like the American style. You've got um, a steel toilet. And in that cell I was in, I, I still remember, it was B213 right at the end. And all the windows were... There was no windows. There's no windows? No, no the, sunlight? No, no windows. Um, just like all the windows were broken and it hasn't been fixed. And when I say freezing, it is freezing. So the glass is gone? Gone. And what is the bars? Just bars, yeah. Okay. And you just put a towel over it, but it's still wow, freezing. I used man. to wake up with leaves all over all over my cell where leaves used to wow, come in. Wow, I had no idea. Freezing, yeah. You're in, you're in so your no bed. There's no temperature control. No, you're in your bed with socks on your hands, with um, like wearing a tracksuit under under the cover, just freezing, yeah, absolutely like freezing. Yeah, Arizona then. Um, so the, the guy comes in, puts the milk he puts on the, the table. puts the milk on the side, and then um, you drink it, throw it out the window. Throw it out the window? Yeah, you just throw that's it, the trash. That's, that's, that's the trash, yeah. <laughs> you throw it out the window, and then um, they'll just open the door, like eight of them. And, and the, they'll say, come downstairs, and you'll go downstairs with them. And downstairs is the day room. Downstairs was, um, yeah, the day room association. Couple what of does pool that look tables, like, the day room? Old, dilapidated. Um, Did you say pool tables? A couple of pool tables. Oh, yeah. they weaponize the sticks. Um, yeah, there's always fights at the pool table. Uh, when oh, you bought a pool ball in a sock. All the time, yeah, it gets used. Um, the What happens on the pool table is you'll say, I'm next, and then you'll be waiting. And then when it's your turn, someone will just grab the triangle and start setting up the balls. And then you'll say, what are you doing? I'm next. And then you, you have to fight. You have to fight. And that's that's the, the if you're going to play pool, that's that's what will happen. It will, it will it, 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 and people just stay on. They'll try and, you know, victimize you and you have to fight and, yeah. and you have to draw blood and you have to get a weapon and you have to, hurt them that's what you have to do and you, you there's no um fair rules you, you you hurt them you do it from behind you do it in the dinner queue when they're not looking because they'll do it to you Survival of the fittest. yeah they'll do it to you um but with the milk what what they've done they've tricked me because on the bottom of the milk they write b213 and then they find it on the floor and what does that mean because they've wrote my cell number on the bottom of the milk. Yeah. Yeah. So then they'll drag me down into the office. Oh, and for trashing it? Yeah, for throwing it. Um, and they'll put you in this kangaroo court type situation. It's not a, a normal adjudication with a governor. Mm. It's just a principal officer. So like a senior officer sitting there. He won't even look at you. He'll just say, um, yeah, guilty, throwing uh, milk out the window. And they'll say two weeks loss of TV. So they'll come and take your TV. Yeah. And then... A few days later, or within that two-week period of having no TV, so you've just got your music now, um, they'll knock on your door and they'll say, do you want the gym? And because you banged up all the time, you'll say, yeah, I want the gym. Um, and then th they'll all come for gym and they'll walk straight past your door and not open your door. So you'll put your bell on and then they'll all they'll wait till the wing's quiet and then they'll all come up and say, what's the emergency? All right, so for Americans watching this, what does that mean, put your bell on? So you've got an emergency cell bell, so you push it. Okay. Um, it's supposed to only be for emergencies. Yeah. Um, and the officer will come to the door. But in Aylesbury, they just slam the flap and they go, what's the emergency? Um, so uh, people use the bell. Pe people misuse it. They say, Gov, can you go and get me a roll-up off number two? Or... Um, you know, I need to see um, like a listener, a Samaritan, I'm suicidal or yeah. um, so it's used for various different things. Um, 
But um, yeah, the, the, so you put your bell on, and, and I said to I said to the officer, like you didn't let me out for gym, so he just slammed the flap. He said that's not an emer- not an emergency. Two weeks more, no TV, um, and so they're kind of like stitching you up and mm-hmm. setting you up. And then what happens is on the day you're supposed to get your TV back, you'll come out for lunch because um, they haven't given it back to you, even though you're supposed to have it back, mm-hmm. and they won't give it back to you. And then you ask them again at tea. And they won't give it back to you. And then it gets to eight o'clock where the night staff are coming on. So you put your bell on because they haven't given it back. And then they'll come to your flat. What's the emergency? And you'll say, I was supposed to get my TV back. They'll say, that's not an emergency. Four weeks more, no TV. Then they take your radio. Then they take your association off you. And you end up being banged up for 24 hours a day. And you'll come out three or four nights a week for 10 minutes for a shower. And that's it. Um, Because... No one really used to go on the yard there because it was at seven in the morning. You get about 10 people out there. No one really used to go out there. That's why um, they do it early, isn't it? So the guards have to supervise people. Yeah, probably. And uh, and then they grind you down. And then and then, then they start um, escalating it because it's like a game to them. Um, the, the officers, when I was in Aylesbury, were a bunch of guys who seemed to be quite sadistic and brutal who seemed to get a kick out of coming into that work environment and just kicking the shit out of teenagers. Um, You'd smell alcohol on their breath sometimes. Um, And what they would do, they would open your door and again, giving you the milk and they wouldn't put it on the table. So you'd get up half asleep and go to grab it and they'd pull it back. And then eventually your arm would be like near the door. And then they would just grab your arm and just jump on you and start shouting, violent prisoner in B213, violent prisoner in 213. In Aylesbury, there's probably 15 alarm bells a day, every single day, seven days a week, 15 alarm bells. And um, they just come from everywhere, power in numbers, and they all, 40, 50 officers, they all come um, and they throw you on the floor. Um they drag you into the segregation unit and it's all through corners, no cameras um, then, there was no cameras then, all dark corners, thin staircases, they're smashing your head on the side, giving you little digs. And then they drag you into like a concrete room, like a segregation unit with a concrete slab on the floor. Um, And they throw you on the floor, they pull a knife out, cut your clothes off, strip you naked um, and really hurt you, you know, they, they, bring your thumbs back um and it's so it feels so um you feel helpless you feel terrified scared you hear these stories that they've killed people um covered it up um and yeah you just feel i'd been restrained in other prisons but this place was just different it was just a really horrendous place and what they do in aylesbury they then put you in that cell and they leave you naked on this concrete slab and you're 18 years old but what they do in Aylesbury, it's not done then. They come back and taunt you. So they come back to the cell, shaking their keys, opening the flap, and they come back at two, three, four o'clock in the morning um, saying, have you had enough yet? Is that what you wanted, son? Do you know what I mean? And they grind you down. And now you're in this concrete tomb. It's a concrete tomb. Um, you know, you've got, um, it's it's summer, 90 degrees. There's no air. There's no air in the cell. The taps don't run. They just drip because they've been smashed up so many times and not fixed properly. And it's the building so old and the plumbing so, so old, Um, you know, and you're living, you're living in this, in this room, just going out of, going out of your mind and you you start to um, lose your mind. When I watch the, uh, your videos and I hear the Americans talking about, isolation and segregation units. And I know they're reducing it in as many as 20 or 30 states in America. I mean, that's been quite successful. Um, in this country, as a young offender, you're only supposed to be in in isolation f- uh, but at the age between, I think 15 to 17, it's a week, 18 to 21, it's two weeks and over 21, it's three weeks. But in the American system, they put them in isolation for years, years. And you, when you hear them talk about it, I can identify it because it's true what the Americans say when they say you begin to hallucinate. You start seeing things on the wall because you're banged up in a room tw- tw- 23 and, and three quarter hours a day. You might get a shower, 
two or three or four times a week if you're lucky, bit of yard, time for 20 minutes walking around in a goldfish bowl, and you're just alone with your mind. Um, and you, you go crazy, you lose your mind, you become very paranoid, um, you have no human interaction with anybody because they just open the door with like eight of them um, and just throw your dinner in. Um, so you die from a lack of love. You die from that, that lack of human interaction. Um, and uh, in Aylesbury, it just seemed, you know, that they could, all those rules and regulations about 14 days or whatever, you know, they would, what they would do, they were clever. So you'd get the 14 days in the block, um, in the isolation. On the 14th day at tea time, they would just swing the door open and, and the fear, you'd feel all the fear because you know these guys have proven to you that they can attack you at any time with no provocation from you. Um, and so just the fear, listening to them all coming up the stairs, all the keys, and they'd be laughing and joking. Um, and you, you do get, you are paranoid, but you, do, you there is reality in the sense that these guys can take my life. They could kill me and, they, and, and cover it up. Um, so they'd all come up the stairs. And I remember being in there for 14 days. The 14 days had expired. They opened the door. They said, are oh, you moving back to B-Wing tomorrow? I'll take that as a no then. Here's your nick and sheet. And just threw the nick and sheet on the floor and shut the door. What's a nick and sheet? A nick and sheet is a governor's report of an offence. So they have these range of prison offences. Um, and he'd written on there, refuses a direct order to move back to B-Wing. But he didn't even give me the opportunity. Just... And then you go on the adjudication in the morning. It's a long table with the governor at the end. And then you have two prison officers right here. So facing you and they just eyeball you and they're big and they, and they intimidate you. That's what they do. You'll have another couple over here because people have, you know, you know, tried to attack them before. If you give any indication in your body language or in the tone of your voice being aggressive, that um, suggests that, that there's going to be any aggression. They just, fold you up they just get you on the deck um and you, when you're banged up you hear it happening you hear pe the screams um you know of people being twisted up uh bent up um and yeah he, he sat there and told the governor on that particular occasion that i refused the order and you're just you're just so angry and then they laugh at you and smirk at you and that's what they do they grind you down um and around about this time was when it had been proven, it had been proven the officers had been done for it, that they were putting bets on 16, 17 year olds um, to see when they could get them to kill themselves. There was one particular case, the guy had, um, the guy was a white supremacist. He had a swastika on his forehead. The Indian guy that they put in the double cell with him um, was 15 years old um, and they put a bet on they um, putting him in the cell. He was being released the next day, the Indian, who's 15 years old, and they put this white supremacist in there and he beat him in Feltham Young Offenders Institution. They had bets on it, on the outcome, um, you know, who was going to beat who, and he killed, battered him to death with a table leg and killed him. Oh. Um, and the reason the public in, in this country don't know about these cases is because the Home Office is protected by top level absolutely outstanding qcs and what does home office mean and what does qc mean just for people watching this so the, the home office is the british government's um office that deals with um like the judiciary immigration and I issues like so that it's like the ministry of justice yeah yeah like the similar to the ministry of justice and a qc is a like a top level barrister um you know, who 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 is vastly experienced in crown court trials. And so barrister is like a lawyer or legislator. Yeah, yeah. And um, the Home Office have all these, have so many of these cases going on all the time, um, at any one time throughout 12 months of the year um, in England and Wales. And what they do, they set, always settle out of court and just pay the people off. Um, so prisoners who've come out with no job, who don't have a lot of money and they're offered £20,000, £15,000, they just take it. Yeah. They just take it. And um, 
they very, very, very rarely take these cases to trial because they always they always settle the cases. So that's that what Arizona Department of Corrections was the same. Like someone sues for the hepatitis C damage because they didn't get the treatment, mm. and they just settle out of court to get rid of them so that they don't have to set a precedent and give everybody the hepatitis C treatment. Yeah. But just going back to your story specifically again now, you've given us a brilliant, detailed description of this young offenders prison and how it sounds to me like the abuse that they've done to you might have pushed you to the point of contemplating suicide. Did yeah. you, were you contemplating suicide at this point? Yeah, I was very suicidal. Um, I was kept in that segregation unit for so long. How long? Um, I was in and out of there for a, th a period of 13 months. But even when I went back to the wing, I was banged up for 24 hours a day on the wing anyway. Yeah. So it was just the same, really. So they targeted you for this abuse. Um, and what, what, what? One of the things that was um, affecting the deterioration of my mental health, um, because I identified with it from one of your videos, was this cell. I'll never forget it. B two thirteen, the corner cell. It was the second or third day I was in the cell. I remember turning the light off with the telly on. So I just had the light from the telly. I've got these windows with all this air, this cold air coming through, um, this really old decaying um, cell with just bricks, this steel toilet, um, poor plumbing, like I said. Um, and I remember turning the light off and I remember smoking um, a hash joint and just watching the telly. And I remember hearing, and I, and I thought, what's that? So I jumped up, turned the light on, and I saw a cockroach. It must have been two and a half inches long like that, really thick and wide. And it just, it was just horrible seeing it. And in my mind, I thought, that's come under my door. So, um, and then I, I clocked that. I saw other people blocking their doors up. So I blocked the door up with newspaper. I got my brush and flicked it out covering up my door and then I turned the light off again watch, sitting there watching the telly on my bed and then two minutes later I heard and I got up and there was another two of them and the, just seeing them it was just oh it's just horrible because they're so big um, and I this time I, 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 I flicked them out the door laid back down but I couldn't relax because of the the, 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 the visual memory of seeing these horrible creatures and then um so again, two minutes later, after I turned the light off, this time when I turned the light on, they were everywhere. It was like there was a nest in there. They were on the walls, all coming out the side of the toilet. They were coming in the window and the whole cell was just crawling with them. So I had two options. Um, and it, it yeah, it, it, it reminds me of when you tell your stories and you say, right, this is a situation where you have two or three options and none of the options are good. So I've got two options. I can smash the cell up um, and then I have to endure all the um, the stress and the physical pain of them all coming in on me and getting attacked by the officers and dragged all the way down to the sec. The only way I can get out of this cell, they're not going to move me. Um, to, you know, you can't make them request so They run that place. You know, you don't have a say in these things. You, they're not going to move me to another cell. So I've got two options. I can either just stay in there or I can um, smash the cell up and go down to the isolation unit again. So I decided to stay in there. Um, and I used to wrap, I moved the bed because it wasn't bolted down. I moved it into the middle of the cell, blocked up all the holes, blocked up the door, blocked up the thing. Um, and I used to just lay like that with the light. The light used to be on 24 hours a day. I never used to turn the light off and I would just be like that under the sheet and just hardly ever, ever slept. I would sleep for an hour, half an hour, two hours, um, and, and, and just never slept. And that was really affecting. And, you know, I was in that cell for... I was in that cell for two, two and a half years in that cell. Grief. Two and a half. So you you were thinking about killing yourself then, for lack the, of sleep? When, when I was thinking about killing myself was um, when I was in the segregation unit, they kept doing all these stupid things to keep me in there. They were intimidating me. Um, they made me believe that I was, they were going to kill me and cover it up. Um, and they used to taunt me, laugh at me, shake their keys. They, 
they my wrists my body was so weak I, I was so um skinny and deteriorating physically psychologically i was paranoid i was um, losing my mind um these long periods of isolation weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks month after month um of being banged up for 24 hours a day um and no music um all they'd let you have would be a prison bible and prison toiletries that's all they would let you have um down there and um what there was one time they put me on one of these stupid kangaroo court adjudications for some bullshit um i can't even remember what it was and um i i was so angry with this officer um, that I wanted to attack him. Um, if you attack an officer in Aylesbury, it's game over for you. Um, and I remember coming out of the adjudication um, and I I went like that to him. And as soon as I went like that, they all just jumped on me and they dragged me into this cell on, 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 on the bottom landing, um, this freezing cold concrete cell. Um, and they broke both my wrists they smashed my ribs in. They were kicking me in the face. Um, there must have been, the whole room was full up with officers, about probably 15 of them. They were kicking me, kneeing me, punching me in the head. That I had long hair. They ripped all my hair out. They stripped me naked. Um, they were all laughing and taunting me as they were doing it. Um, and then they put me up against the back wall with my hands up, up there. And when when they bend your wrists and you scream and they do it more, it's like torture because yeah. they're doing it because you're screaming. They're doing it more, and um, they just they, they they just put me through this. It, you know, control and restraint if it's done properly doesn't even hurt if it's done properly. But they what they were doing was really brutal, and they beat me um, and they kept me naked while they were all standing there laughing at me for what seemed like forever really. But it was, I think it was about 15, 20 minutes. Th this whole episode was about half an hour and they left me in the cell and my wrists were already sore. Um, and what they used to do, they used to do this twice a day at lunch and tea time. They would say, you're too violent. They say, you're too violent to see anybody. So they wouldn't let you see anybody. And they wouldn't let you come out of that that room. So they would put your dinner in the cell next door. Then they would put um, shields on and hats and riot gear. And they'd, they'd just open a flap and say, stand at the back wall, stand at the back wall. And you'd like, oh, you're pleading with them. Yeah. In the other younger thing, you'd give it, give it a bit of mouth. But this place, you, you plead with them, please, please, like, I don't want any trouble. And then they'd just storm in the cell, throw you on the floor, squash you into the corner with the sh with the big plastic shields um squash you into the corner get your hands bend you up take you into the next cell throw you in the cell all run out and they'd do that to you twice a day to feed you um so i became really weak um psychologically weak my mental health was deteriorating um they'd ripped all my hair i kept it i kept it in my shoe because there was so much of it and i kept it as evidence um, and I started writing down what they were doing to me. I started writing it all down. Um, and, uh, I remember being on that one's land and I think it was, it was, it was summertime now. I was dehydrating. I had no running water. I would get two hot drinks a day that they'd bring in. Other than that, I had nothing to drink. So I ended up having to drink the toilet water in these toilets are like disgusting, just absolutely all, um, like scaling up the side all green um and I end up having to drink the toilet water just to just to hydrate myself there's no air in the cell there's no window the windows don't open there's just little holes but they're all blocked up and I'm dripping with sweat um just losing weight deteriorating in the cell and I remember ripping I remember just being so scared and terrified in there and um, I remember ripping the sheet and there was nowhere really to to hang the sheet. Um, the only place to hang the sheet was on the taps. Um, and I remember putting the noose around my neck and tying it onto the taps and just just sitting there with it like round my neck. Um, I still remember it, but it is it is. Um, I don't think I wanted. I think I wanted. I I did want to die, but I just didn't. 
I wasn't, I didn't have the the ability in the cell to actually go through with it. Do you see what I mean? Um, and uh, yeah, it's just a horrendous experience. I was really awful. I had nightmares for 10 years afterwards. Um, even now, so I was 18 then, I'm now 36. If anybody's behind me when I'm out on the street, just walking around or just going about my daily business, I can't tolerate at all anyone behind me yeah. um, be, because they would always jump me um, from behind and grab me. Um, and that that's still with me. I still have that today. I, and when I'm walking the street, I'll, I'll move over and let people pass me. I can't have people behind me. Yeah. Um, and yeah, well, it, it, it has been, um, it was, it has, was a tra traumatizing experience. I'd wake up, um, I'd wake up, in the middle of the night, covered in sweat, um, thinking there's 15 prison officers there. Um, I'd see their faces. I still remember their names. I still remember their faces. Um, I went to court against them in Oxford. And interestingly, on YouTube, there is a video of Aylesbury Young Offenders Institution. And it's, it is actually um, one of the only UK prison documentaries which will quite accurately show what it's really? like in there if you if you watch that video you'll just see on the cameras the gang fights what's it called on youtube do you know i'll put it in the description box H for the viewers hmp aylesbury okay but it's not actually an hmp hmp means adult prison it's hmyoi young offenders institution aylesbury yeah um but you see the gang fights you see officers punching inmates yeah um but i saw a couple of faces a couple of officers on that that, that i remembered um saying to the documentary maker yeah we really care about um you know the prisoners we just want to deliver care yeah um but you, you it does give you quite an accurate reflection of what the prison is actually like um big and, and like i said i it, I, rec I, I believe, Sean, that that uh, documentary is so accurate because y if you take a film crew into Aylesbury, you can't avoid it because there's 15 alarm bells a day. So you're going to get loads of juicy footage, even going in there for 24 hours. Wow. Um, but yeah, awful, awful place. People in there have committed serious crimes, long-termers, um, a lot of people in there for murder, rape, um, gang crime. Um, but the we have to we we have to the prison service mission statement is to tr detain those sent by the courts and to treat them with dignity and respect and to help them lead law abiding lives and useful lives in the future what i'm describing uh, my experiences in Aylesbury is not consistent with that mission statement um in any way shape or form and with it and with an 86 percent um reconviction statistic for young offenders within the first two years of them being released um that that, that, that shows the which is the highest in western europe for young people um in prison um that shows you that there is no rehabilitation in in, in that young offenders institution estate in our country no rehabilitation at all I we agree. create we, we it's proven on rats and it's proven on animals if you lock somebody up for 24 hours a day in isolation, 23 hours a day, it makes you more aggressive. It makes you more violent. It makes you have difficulties in your interpersonal relationships. Um, and you get all the horror stories in America of people spending so long in isolation and then they'll go and stab someone 150 times because they just lose their mind. Um, it, and it's it's proven and it's, it's, yeah, it's horrendous. I really appreciate you detailing that story because young people in this country they're glamorized into thinking that prison is a holiday camp and these things only happen in America. When I tell my story, some of them think these things only happen in America. So thanks for that story, Pepsi. Now let's just go and figure out who is Pepsi. What is your backstory? How did you end up getting into crime? Early, you said you're from Newcastle. Mm. That's like from London. That's like for the foreign viewers. It's like halfway to Scotland, isn't it? Yeah, it's up north. Yeah, the cold. <laughs> Is that where you're born? The cold part. Yeah, yeah, that's where I was born. Yeah. And what was your upbringing like? Um, my upbringing was good. Um, I was born in Ashington, which is the same hospital as the Charlton brothers, Bobby and Jackie Charlton, the English football players. Uh, my dad worked on the oil rigs. Um, my mum stayed at home, looked after me and my brother, and uh, yeah, my upbringing was good. Um, I lived there 
up there in Newcastle until I was eight years old. And then my dad got a land job because uh, he's working on the rigs. He got a land job down in Norwich. Uh, so we, my family, me and my brother, my mum and dad all worked, moved down to Norwich, uh, lived in Norwich. Which is on the far east coast of the UK. Yeah, it? east coast. Yeah. yeah, east coast of the UK. Um, 20 miles from the beach. Um, and how were you in school? In school, I was uh, doing lines a lot, getting into trouble. You, um, you do lines detention. Like, yeah, detention. Yeah. I must not um, be naughty in class, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I think I used to do my work really quickly and then get bored. Yeah. And then so I'd start disrupting the class and stuff. <laughs> Bit uh, of a class clown. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, I liked school. Uh, I liked football. What subject did you like? I liked um, English. I liked maths, doing numbers. Um, I liked science. And what was your goal? Did you have a goal at that age? Um, yeah, I wanted to get into music. Uh, I wanted to do music. Um, I, I played the drums. I played the piano for a while. Um, and I remember wanting to get into making music and stuff like that. But unfortunately, circumstances out of my control, I never had the opportunity to kind of um, pursue my interests because uh, my grandmother got ill. Um, she died very quickly. It was very sad. Um, and I had a big, big impact on my mum and her sisters. Um, and... Uh, yeah, it was just a really difficult time for our whole family. Um, so you aspired to go college, music, mm. but things came, happened that prevented that. Yeah, and I, I started like smoking cannabis when I was 12, um, knocking around with the wrong crowd, stuff like that. So was there some early crime around that time? I wasn't committing any crime, um, sort of 12, 13. I was just smoking a lot of cannabis. Once I got a taste for cannabis, it just, I don't know, it gave me a feeling of um, like completeness, really. It gave me a, a really nice kind of warm feeling that just made me um, kind of just feel good, good about life, really. Um, it was exciting. It was a thrill, the sneaking around, um, doing it with my friends. Um, and it, yeah, it just escalated really to amphetamines. I was doing amphetamines. Um, ketamine, ecstasy, uh, ecstasy, um, drinking, um, and then my dad left when I was 13. My dad split up with my mum and left. Um, by this time I was, um, quite wayward. I was always sort of out missing with my friends. Um, I started committing crime. I started breaking into houses. So you're staying with your mum, dad's gone? You don't see him anymore? No, he, he, he went. Um, he left. Um, I went to, he tried to help me, put me into a good school, um, him and his sister, my auntie. Um, but I was only at the school a few weeks, I ended up running off. That was down in um, Cobham, down in Cobham. So your mum ended up down here? No, uh, my mum's still in Norwich. My dad came to Guildford. I see. Um, and... Um, my auntie was in Weybridge and my dad and my auntie tried to put me in a, a, a good school in Cobham. I just spoke at a school in Cobham yesterday. Yeah. What was the school? Reeds. Reeds. Reeds okay. Yeah. I've heard of Reeds. I spoke at ACS. It's like an international school. Yeah. Fantastic school. You know, and I can't knock my family. They get, tried to give me the best opportunity. Um, it's fantastic school. Um, they got me in there. Um, but I was just, just, yeah, smoking loads of cannabis getting into trouble, running off. I ended up running off from there, going back to Norwich, um, hanging around my, with my old friends uh, and just smoking cannabis all the time. Um, started stealing cars, uh, breaking into properties. So why are you stealing cars? Do you need money to buy drugs? Nah, just for fun. Fun? Yeah, we used to steal cars, um, fill them up with petrol, drive off. Um, take ecstasy and just race them all around the countryside. Green. That's what we used to do. Yeah, just teenage pranks then. Yeah, and yeah. did you get busted doing that? Yeah, got arrested in car chases. Um, 
we'd never stop if the police came. We'd always, you know, drive off. Um, actually enjoy it, get a buzz out of it. Adrenaline um, junkie. Yeah. Because um, we used to take ecstasy and then we used to steal cars, take ecstasy. Um, and yeah, just. What kind of ecstasy is this? Well, I took ecstasy. I wanted to dance and smile and hug people and tell them my life story. You took ecstasy, you want to steal cars. Yeah, I remember that they were. Um, <laughs> come forward a bit. They were, yeah, four leaf clovers, Mitsubishi turbos at that time. What are they putting in them? Like PCP? Speed? <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah, it was a there crazy time. There was a period time. in the UK where <laughs> they clamped down on, they couldn't get the proper ingredients for ecstasy, so they were putting a lot of junk stuff in them to like try and sell them as ecstasy. Mm. But um, do you just react differently to ecstasy in general, or was it stuff that was speedy and made you want to do other things? We, we uh, I think, um, well, we used to just, love taking drugs we'd do xc in the daytime yeah. walking down the road we'd just do them yeah well all right uh, i can understand yeah. that walking around the countryside and smiling at the trees <laughs> yeah but stealing cars and getting in police chases on xc yeah that would freak my brain out i just want to be doing something mellow and happy mm. you know smiling and dancing whatever yeah we used to go out and stuff as well yeah we used to go out um but at that time the friends that i had and we we used to just do crazy stuff like that. Yeah, we used to do crazy stuff. And I remember being in the in the cars and there'd be five police cars behind us and all you could you're high on the ecstasy and all you could see and hear is blue flashing lights and you're tripping a bit. Yeah, very, very um just vivid experience. Yeah. It's like you create your own Hollywood movie with the police chase. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but um So this is what landed you in the first time then. Yeah, I mean I was running away quite a lot from from home and i was i yeah i kind of just lost my way really and um it, you know my dad had left uh my mum hadn't been very well um but she'd done her best to look after me um i've got a great relationship with my mum you know still now and um yeah i was just making silly choices really yeah um, and i was young but i was still still being irresponsible making stupid choices what was your first conviction uh, stealing a, a bike when I was motorbike, no, nah, a, p a push bike, pedal okay. bike. Okay, and what, what did that escalate into? What were your, what were your other convictions? Uh, it, it, that escalated to stealing cars and then uh, burgling properties, commercial properties, um, dwelling properties. Um, yeah, just not stuff that I'm proud so you're of. On a bad, yeah, you're on a bad path. And then um, my drug addiction kind of escalated to harder drugs. Heroin. Heroin and crack cocaine. Oh, my goodness. Um, as soon as I got on the crack cocaine, um, that's when I started getting longer, pr long prison sentences. Did you have to start stealing at that point to finance your habit? Crack cocaine I was, yeah. Yeah, I was stealing to um, finance my habit. And then I started doing like shop robberies. Uh, pulling up in a stolen car, running in a shop, um, robbing the till, holding up the shop, um, sometimes with a knife, um, drive off, um, spend the money on crack cocaine. As soon as that crack cocaine got a hold of me, it's, that's when I started getting longer sentences. But I'd already been in and out, in and out. Um, I first got locked up when I was 14. That was for 11 um, burglaries. That was in Stamford House and Shepherd's Bush in London. So it's a secure unit um, for people who are under the age of 15 because you have to be 15 to go to like a proper prison in this country. So if you're under 15, you'll go to a secure unit, um, which is would have been the place where um, like Venables and Thompson went when they were under 15. Um, and, uh, and then when I was 15, I was back in my first sentence was nine months um and then i just had all sorts of different sentences 12 months six months eight months nine months ten months um remand time um for all the kind of offenses i was talking about and then it started doing robberies and then as soon as i started doing robberies that's when i got the four years so you what you were on heroin first and then crack i started taking heroin when i was 15 years old but taking um, it in what what way uh, smoking it, injecting it. You were injecting heroin at injecting 15? Injecting heroin at 15. And how old were you when you started on crack? Uh, 17. 17 on crack. Mm. Now, my mate, Wild Man, he ended up in America with me. And he he, he was smoking 
crack like up to a hundred dollar rock at a time mm. off the, the, this Colombian drug lord who buzzed off just seeing how big a crack rock he could smoke yeah. but wild man had me try crack and after being an ecstasy head you know where you're dancing for five or six hours um and then i smoked this crack and got this euphoria mm. that lasted like seconds and thank god i i, I didn't like it you know because because mm. i see how people go downhill so fast on it what was it that tr that you enjoy because i didn't like that uh, to me that was a disappointment yeah it's so, and that's some people's experience they'll do it once and or do it a couple of times and it doesn't you know it doesn't do it for them and uh, there is a arguably a valid argument to say ecstasy is a better but, uh, feeling than crack cocaine um when you peak on an ecstasy tablet that 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 rush yeah um and like you say with crack cocaine it is an intense euphoria but it's over in a few seconds yeah, yeah. um i think with me um at that age 17 at that time and i've done all sorts of other drugs i've done a lot of prescription drugs as well tomazepam valium uh, mixing them with alcohol um just to oblivion really um but with crack i don't know as soon as i picked it up it just I just loved the feeling of it. I just loved the feeling. It just made me feel powerful, invincible, um, and I just I just always wanted more. So you've got two crescendos you described. Uh, you've got the invincible, powerful feeling. When I did Crystal Meth, I felt like that. But then you've also got the oblivion feeling mm -hmm. where you're almost pushing yourself to the brink of death. Uh -huh. Why would you want to do that? I did it myself, but I'm just asking, I'm wondering what, what was going on in your mind that made you push yourself to that oblivion crescendo? I think at that time, at that age, is naivety, um, no education around drugs, um, uh, just being young and having that kind of, um, that kind of fearlessness um, of, of just, having like not much regard um for for your life do you not care if you lived or died at that point well when you're stealing cars and driving through red lights at 120 mile an hour um no um you couldn't pay me a million pounds to do that today yeah um but uh, yeah at that time yeah just very reckless god you're lucky you didn't crash and kill anyone yeah yeah i've had friends who've died my friend wayne um, he died at 18 from a heroin overdose. No, 20, 21 he was. Yeah. I mean, he, and he'd already had a really bad, um, like, car crash, um, just skipping a junction and a car hit him coming the other way. Um, so did you, did you, if you had some money and you had a pref, and you had a choice of either crack or heroin, which one would you go for at this point? Crack cocaine, yeah. Go for the crack cocaine. Definitely, yeah. Okay. So this now is going to land you into bigger charges mm -hmm. what was your most serious charges um well th there was a time when um i was doing prescription drugs and mixing them with alcohol and um i was breaking into houses um with weapons okay um knives guns knives yeah. machetes long like, like kitchen knives yeah um and i was getting arrested a few times for those kind of offenses i'd yeah. be put on id parades where mm -hmm. you like a lineup and um, yeah, a few times I didn't, um, and then I ended up getting charged with one. I got charged with one of those when I was 16, yeah. um, but cause I was young, um, they kept it in the youth court and they just gave me 12 months. If right. I'd gone into a higher court, mm -hmm. um, I'd have got like a few years for that. Yeah. Um, well, so you were a scary individual at one point. Yeah, I was very violent, very reckless. And was um, you associated with any kind of gang? No, well, I had a group of friends. Uh, we we weren't in a gang. Um, it, it's not really like that um, where where I was living in Norwich. Um, so no, I wasn't part of a gang. What about in London? Um, no, not in London. Okay. No. All right. So we've done your young offender place, and you've told me how you ended up, you know, going into this life of crime. What about the adult prison experience then for you? How was that? And what was the first adult prison? The first adult prison I went to was HMP Bullingdon when I was 21 years old. Whereabouts is that? O Bicester in Oxford. Okay. Um, so like the 
kind of leafy suburbs um, in England, I suppose. Uh, kind of in the middle of yeah. Birmingham. And uh, so I'd done the three years in Aylesbury. I turned 21, and because mm -hmm. I was 21, they sent me to an adult prison. And I just remember, I remember the day I went there being scared, thinking it was going to be Aylesbury, but worse yeah. because it's adults. Um, and I remember walking onto the landing, onto the onto the unit, onto the wing, three landings. Um, and then I just remember sensing the atmosphere, like this is different. Um, it's more laid back. There's not, hard, I can't see any officers. People are in each other's cells drinking coffee. Um, and yeah, I went into a cell. It was a three man cell, two, two older, older guys. Um, they were really sound. Um, we used to play cards and smoke hash. Um, and it was a lot more chilled out, but when it was violent, the violence would be more extreme. Like people would get cut. Um, people would get stabbed. Um, it's not 10 seconds. It's in a cell with the door shut. Um, and there's no one going to hear your screams or coming to help you. So the violence was worse when it happened, but less frequent. Um, that parallels the American experience then, because when I was in the Rumand jail, Maricopa County jail, the gladiator school was like the lower security level because mm. it's just were housed full of young men who, like you said earlier, testosterone charge, got something to prove. Yeah. But then as I went up the levels, I was in medium security my first year. Second year, maximum security, Madison Street Jail. These guys are like in for murders and long-term sentences like crystal meth chemists and stuff. There's a really serious atmosphere, mm. but there's nowhere near the level of fighting because if these guys go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, maybe someone's not going to come out there alive and they know mm. that. So it's got to be a serious beef for there to be uh, a battle going down. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're experiencing as well. Yeah, I mean, this was 2003, it's 15 years ago. Um, now it has changed in the last 15 years. Um, the, I've been to a lot of different adult prisons, um, Wayland, High Point, Norwich, Chelmsford, uh, Bullingdon, Woodhill, which is a, a maximum security, uh, what the Americans would call a maximum security. We would call that a category A um, high security prison. Um, and uh, our prisons at the minute are just, you, you're starting to see things. When I watch your videos, it's, it's frightening um, the, the what we're seeing over here at the minute in the UK because we're starting to see over here what you see, not anywhere near the same scale, but we're starting to see signs um, uh, uh, of the mass warehousing type um, custody that you see in America yeah. over here. So what I'm talking about is male rape in adult prisons and murder mm -hmm. uh, because mass warehousing is characterized from what I've seen in America. Mass warehousing of prisoners um, is characterized by the murder of prison officers, um, the murder of... Uh, murder, suicides, mental health epidemic, a drug epidemic of proportions that have just never been seen before, yeah. a general lawlessness. Um, and uh, there was a, a, a bad murder up in Pentonville. Um, in, in, in this country, you will get one or two murders every year in prison, mainly in the Cat A high security prisons where the guys are doing 30 year, 40 year sentences. But you started to see them in the lower category prisons like right. Pentonville, that was a bad knife murder. Um, you're starting to see, um, you know, I've seen um, videos about British prisons recently and um, where they're saying sort of rape doesn't, rape, male rape does go on in British prisons. Yeah. It does go on. Um, it's not as endemic as in the American penitentiaries, but it is starting to happen over here where um, people are just banged up 23 and a half hours a day. There's no staff. Um, we've got a mental health epidemic. Suicides are just through the roof. Um, our prisons now are very unsafe, very dangerous. Um, guards are getting attacked regularly. Seven riots in the last year, isn't it, Ben? The last two or three years, I mean, the they brought a smoking ban out and they brought it out at the worst time. Um, Bristol... Birmingham was smashed to pieces, three wings. They nearly took control of the whole prison. Um, 
they've been rioting up in the Cat A prisons, like in Long Larton. Um, you've had an insane amount of suicides at Wood Hill prison. I think as many as 18 or 20 um, in like a two year period or something, just an insane amount. Um, Let's go back then to, you're saying, talking about your first day in the adult prison mm, now. Yeah. So you're saying that it was more stable, but if something goes off, it's going to get deadly. Yeah. Come on, how are you then going in? How did you feel? What's, what's I, happening with the, you? Well, these two guys, I went into this three man cell. I was at the end of this four year sentence and um, I only had about four months left. And um, you've been assigned to a four man cell? Three man cell. Three man cell. Three man cell. Are, the, are the bunks on top of each other? You got one on its own, yeah. quite a big room, really, quite a big cell, one yeah. on its own, and then a double. And um, these two guys just made it um, bearable and made it made it okay for you. Yeah, they were just really you got on with them, really sound, um, you know, and they were well respected on the unit, so no one gave them any trouble. Yeah, I was new, um, and yeah, I just had a bit of good luck really Sean and I had no problems in that prison whatsoever for the mm. last four months yeah but the day that I got released I still remember that day it was a boiling hot day is this the end of your 13 years now the, the end of the four-year sentence so I was 21 yeah um I've come out um after the three years in that awful young offenders institution I've yeah. done my last four months in this adult prison and I remember the day that I come out, I was terrified about coming out. Mm -hmm. um, my, what I'd been through, those awful experiences, and nobody comes to see you in the prison and says, oh, you're getting out soon. Do you need any help or anything like that? You, you just, and as the time was getting closer, it was going really fast. It wasn't dragging, it was going, and I was terrified about coming out. And the day that I come out, it was 90 degrees, it was June, really hot. And um, they just took me to the gate, opened the gate, and just said, said, sign here, sign your license. And then I left. And I remember just sitting down on the grass in outside this adult prison in Oxford, um, boiling hot, with 40 pounds in my pocket, with nowhere to go, nothing, they didn't even know how to get like back to the area, um, like back to Norwich. And I just sat there, um, just, yeah, just, uh, just scared and just, um, just really traumatized from what had happened, really. And I was only out for 35 days and I went back to prison for two years for burgling the jewelers and leaving my blood on the window. Good grief. I was only out a month, 35 days, and I got another. Prior to this release, had you planned on? Going straight post release and not getting back into crime, or did you were you just winging it? No, I'd, I'd never. None of that stuff had even come into my mind because that whole three year period that I was incarcerated was uh, mostly in Aylesbury. It was just a daily battle to just, just your head up, yeah, just to survive. And so there was no um, post release help from the government for you, no at all. mental health help or counselling or anything? Nothing, nothing whatsoever. I didn't even know where to go. They would come to you with a bit of paper and say, have you got an address to go to? Yeah. If you said no, you'd get um, £100. If you said yes, you'd get £40. Um, so I think I put my mum's address on there, £40. That's why I had £40. And um, But I, I didn't go there. I just probably, I can't even remember. I, th I do remember what I did, actually. I, I went, got the train back to Norwich. I went and saw my friend Terry. I bought a bottle of brandy and a 20 pound bag of weed. Um, and I just played basketball with my friend Terry over the park, drinking the brandy and smoking the smoking the weed. That's what so I did. So your head scrambled now from this experience. Mm. You got no help from the government. I'm not making excuses for your crimes, but it's almost a classic example of how going to prison breeds crime. You've not got the tools now to operate as a model citizen and you, you are basically just taking it day by day here, mm. falling back into the crime now. So what made you want to rob a, a jeweler's then? Because it's a big heist. Um, just, I had no money. Um, I was sort of staying with my friend, sofa surfing. I just wanted to get high. Um, are you back on heroin and crack? No, I was smoking weed, drinking brandy. Um, I can't, I can't remember smoking crack at that time or heroin. No, okay. just smoking weed, drinking brandy, um, and just, yeah, I mean, when I reflect back on that time, I think I had no, 
uh, my self confidence had been destroyed. Yeah. Uh, all my self worth, I had no self worth, and the only thing that made me feel any better was just to, to smoke weed and drink. Really, um, I remember walking into Norwich and seeing this jewellers, and I thought, yeah, I can rob it. Um, so were went, you were you high and drunk when you had this notion? Probably, yeah. I mean, I was when I committed a lot of those offences at that time. Um, but I remember going back with my friend uh, with balaclavas, a rucksack, bolt croppers. So it's, is it night time? Is it closed? Night time, yeah. Yeah, and we just we, we did the the mesh with the bolt croppers, smashed the window. As soon as we smashed the window, the alarm went off, um, but we just kept hitting it and hitting it. Um, we took all the trays out, ran off, um, and... Uh, yeah, and then I got I left my blood on the window and I got arrested. Because um, they'd already got a DNA match from when you went in the yeah, first time. Yeah, the solicitor said there'd be one in 60 million chance it's not you, so you have to plead guilty. But when I got arrested and sent to prison for that, this was now my second adult prison experience, which was very different to Bullingdon. So this was A-Wing Norwich, which is a, 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 a B category local prison. So just to explain this to Americans, because Americans have got like minimum medium maximum super max security mm. we've got a b c d e is it we've got category a which is a small cluster of maximum security high, high security prisons so that'd be like the super max so that would be it. the equivalent to the american super max yeah. then we have we have kind of two b cap prisons we have what you would call a b cap training prison yeah which is the 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 second highest security prison where prisoners are serving long sentences mm -hmm. and then you have um the b cat local prisons which are basically remand prisons where prisoners are waiting to be sentenced and convicted yeah then when they get their sentence they might hang around there for a while then they'll get shipped off to a b cat training prison a maximum secure a cat prison or a c cat prison so c cat is the lowest category still a closed prison with a fence mm -hmm. um and then you've got a d cat um which, which is semi-open when you can go out to work and stuff and your crime will generally dictate what category security category you are all right so, so you've got another first day now at the b cat yeah so i'm in a b cat local norwich prison a wing when i walked um when i was in the holding cell i had a gold chain on and a guy said to me i wouldn't walk onto a wing with that on and i was just like yeah whatever i walked onto a wing and it was just a complete jungle. It was four landings, 200 men, long, long, huge, long landings, really dark, dim lit, draconian, Victorian, very old. And then you had three Wendy boxes. They call them Wendy boxes where the, the officers sit and drink tea and play chess and stuff. The ones land in the bottom floor was all sex offenders, paedophiles, and um, snitches. Um, so when they, and what the officers used to do, they would open all three landings and leave the ones locked up and just go, vanish. And it's every man for himself. Um, there's people sharing needles, jacking up heroin, um, people getting robbed, people getting cut. Um, people getting stabbed, uh, just every man for himself. Yeah, every every man for himself in the just totally um, different from the Bullingdon prison that I was in. So you're on edge now. Just just pull your chair a bit closer mm. to the microphone. You're on edge now. Um, are you getting challenged? This is my local area, so. I was okay there because when you're in your local area, you know everyone who's coming in, you will know. And so we had everyone from Norwich there. Then you'll, um, the, the, the gap, there is gangs in prison. Um, What's the gang structure the this place? It's not racial, it's areas. So you've got Norwich, you've got Ipswich. Postcodes. Yeah, like, well, e whole cities. Whole so cities. You, yeah, it's so, London's postcode, so, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, London would be postcodes. Which is a zip code for the Americans. So you just stick together in your group. Um, and because Norwich is in Norwich, most people in there are from Norwich. Um, so you're the majority. Yeah, we're the, we, we would be the majority there, yeah. Um, so you knew people by now. Yeah, yeah, new, new people in there. No, I didn't have any trouble with anybody in there. Um, but again, very intense environment. What about uh, your chain? Did anyone try and get it? 
Now, I ended up taking it off after the first day I was there. This is why I took it off. The first day I was there, I this officer just let me off to land and then vanished, like I said. And then you're just like, you're just in this um, crazy environment. Um, and they brought another new guy on. Now, so you get your canteen once a week. I don't mm -hmm. know how often um, commissary is in America, but you in, in this country, you get canteen once a week. There are a couple of prisons that do it twice a week, but you get it once a week. So they're bringing guys up onto this, this, this madhouse, A-Wing, the day before canteen, yeah? So no one's got anything because it's the day before canteen. Yeah. And when you come in, they give you um, a pack of tobacco. Or if you don't smoke, they give you biscuits, tea, coffee, sugar. So they, the officers open the door and let all these new people in and everyone's just watching them because they know they've got the tobacco. And I saw this one, this tall guy, he's walked in the cell and then I saw three guys go in after him and then the, the tall guy came out with a, a towel on his face where they'd cut him all the way down his face for, for a bit of tobacco that's worth three quid. Um, it's about $5. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's when I took my, I had a ring as well. That's when I took my chain and my ring off and just put them in my pillowcase because then that's when I realized that this is like a dog eat dog environment where people um, could try and rob you or um, take stuff off you. Um, and, uh, yeah, this at that time, there's a lot of heroin creeping into the prison system. And then when I got sentenced, I went off to Wayland Prison. So what were your cellmates like in this one? I was with my friend uh, Brendan, but um, just someone I'd known from the Young Offenders Institutions. We had the same birthday, so we used to joke about that. Saying, two man cell. Saying who was older. <laughs> yeah, two man cell. And he was a bit. He was a big lad, and um, he was. Um, yeah, he was always in the gym. He was a big lad. Didn't used to take any trouble off anyone. And we we would just we used to just look out for each other. Yeah, and, go uh, each other's backs. Yeah, walk around the yard together with our little group. And um, yeah, did, did you see anyone else get brutalised at that prison? It in that prison, it all happens behind the doors. So what what you don't really see it because what happens is is if someone's going to get robbed or stabbed or cut or brutalised. Um, they will go to the door, somebody will stand on the door and then they'll push the bolt out on the door so that they can't shut, lock themselves in, yeah. in a crime scene, what's now going to be a crime scene. And then they'll go and do what they need to do. Um, so you don't really see it because it's behind the doors, but you hear all the stories. People put spoons up people's asses to get drugs out. Um, people go in there and, 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 because people hide the drugs up their ass, so they they force them to get it out. Um, if they refuse, they'll pin them down, put a spoon up um, to get get the drugs out. And you hear of all these stories, but you don't unless you're in the cell when it happens. So I was in a cell, but my friend Bert he robbed someone, um, got someone on the door, and I was in the cell. There was another guy called Red, who was from Ipswich, and. Um, they called the guy into the cell. As soon as he came into the cell, Red stood on the door, shut the door. Um, and they just said, we know you've got a phone. We know you've got drugs. Um, hand them over. And he complied. So he had to go into the toilet area, squat down, take the phone out. Red hit him in the face, punched him, just to, just to give him a little live and to let him know, like, you look, you're getting robbed and you're going to hand it over. And then he gave him the phone, uh, all the drugs, and then the guy just went all white and pale. And it, yeah, I, like when I talk about it now, it's quite, um, that's, that would be quite a traumatizing experience for somebody to go through that. Um, but yeah, that sort of stuff, you know, happens all the time. How were the drugs getting in? At that time, drugs were coming in mainly through visits. What about staff? Um, Cause they keep it on the, on the down low, don't they? So yeah, you might not have not been aware of that. Staff, staff do bring Drugs in the UK, drugs come into prisons through prison officers, other members of staff who work in the prison who yeah. get corrupted or who get seduced by greed and want to make some money, um, visits and over the wall. Yeah. Over the wall, get thrown over the wall um, in tennis balls, mm -hmm. um, thrown over, and then the trusted prisoners will pick the parcels up. Yeah. Um, 
But if if you are in one of those prisons and you are carrying and you have drugs, you've got to be able to look after yourself. Mm -hmm. Because if you if there's any a hint that you, you're any kind of victim, people will just come in with weapons and take take the drugs off the person. Um, so you've got some independent operators who mm -hmm. get fleeced by the more organised, yeah, gangster types. Yeah, the guy I'm talking about who got robbed, he was. Uh, within a category of people who come into prison with money yeah. so they're able to buy bigger bits of uh, 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 of narcotics of drugs um what you know whether it's heroin cannabis weed mm -hmm. and phones um so they've all, because they've got money from mm -hmm. drug dealing and criminal activities they're always able to buy stuff um but they're not buying it to sell they're buying it to use so they can become a target for mm -hmm. extortion and robberies and stuff like that in the prison yeah so it really is just raw survival of the first, isn't it? Mm. So you get through this one quite smoothly then because you got a big cellmate who's your mate. Yeah, yeah. What's the next prison you go to? Uh, the next prison I went to was Wayland, uh, which I got two years, so I served like 14 months. Um, Wayland, I returned to that prison and served uh, five year, another five years in that prison, but I was, so I'm like 21, 22 now, went into Wayland. Um, Wayland... At that time, Wayland uh, was quite a good prison, but uh, there was violence there. Um, it was, it's, it's strange. Like when I watch the American videos and s how the American penitentiaries are a reflection of society in the sense of the racial division. Um, in in this country where we're kind of more liberal, um, again that's reflected in the prison estate, but. Um, like I said, it's areas, um, but then within those areas, there will be arguments and fights. So London will stick together in Wayland. So you'll have London. Um, the Muslims, uh, are more often than not, quite the, the biggest gang in the prison, um, they'll stand on the yard, like 150 of them, 100 of them all together. And if you if you get into trouble with one of them, you'll have all of them on your case. So um, let me ask you this then. Where I was housed, so you got the whites, the blacks, the Mexicans, the Mexican Americans. Mm. Now there was a Muslim services yeah. that blacks went to, so it was like associated with the black gang where I was. Yeah. Now, is the Muslim population in the UK prison system? How is that divided racially? Is it blacks? Is it people from Asia? Is it people from, you know, what 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 what, what, what countries the, the, the are Muslim, they descended the, from? The Muslim gangs um, can be made will be made up of all uh, it could be made up of any any races. It's people of all color, all color could be in the Muslim could be in, gang. The, in the Muslim gang, and then you would have you would have um, the blacks, and then you'd have the whites, but the whites don't really form a gang they just so the blacks are separate to the muslim gang yeah yeah but if you're a black muslim you might be in the muslim gang not the black gang you might be you might not um if in in these prisons it's segregated on the yard but not on the units so in the on the units i would have friends who would be muslim and black and we'd um, play football together play chess drafts together play poker together but on the yard i wouldn't walk around the yard with them um, they got to stand with their people. Yeah, it's kind of like um, it's not really official, um, but it's just what you do. It's yeah. just you know, and when you walk past, you might nod at them, but and and I, I can go over and talk to them and vice versa. But you don't generally. So do you said it. there was just 150 Muslims alone out on the yard yeah. together. Yeah. So how many people total are on the yard in that prison? Is uh, about 1,200 people in that and, prison. Can they all be out at wreck at the same time? Wherever it was. Yeah, yeah. It's a thousand prisoners. Yeah. And you've got the biggest gang then is the Muslim gang. So as the white Muslims then? Yeah, there is white Muslims, but not not many. But there is what like white Muslim converts. And what convert. were the other what were the other divisions on the yard? You would have, like you'd have the London like gangsters, the, the you know the 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 well known names. Um, um, you know, it's like I was listening to. Um, Big Irk uh, talk about how people come in and people know who they are. So you'd always have like Reggie Cray was in in Wayland. Yeah. Um, I think Kenny Noy was there. I know he's in DCAT prison now. Um, but you'd you'd all you'd have um, a kind of main group of Cockney Londoners 
Um, How many people in that? Do you think roughly? It, it could be. It could be anything. It could be twenty, thirty, forty of them. Um, but most people in Wayland, the white guys, would just walk around in their very kind of small, compact groups of between five and ten. Yeah. Um, so you know, ten men together is enough to protect. protect. And when it kicks off there, it, it it's Wayland is so big, and the officers walk around in a big circle, and all the wings are all over the place. Yeah. Um, and when it kicks off, it, it again it happens very quickly, very brutal, very sudden. It's pack mentality. It's not one on one. It's six on one, five on one, and everybody will just, you, you see it and it just all happens so quickly. You'll be walking around mm -hmm. and you'll see six white guys all pull out socks with tuna and bolts in or bars of soap in, 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 in the socks. Mm -hmm. And they'll just rush one guy um, and the guy can't defend himself because he, 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 he faces multiple blows in such quick succession. Yeah. Um, it, it, which leaves them, you know, um, really beaten and bloody very quickly. And then they'll all just run off, hide the weapons, give them to their friends and just disperse. Um, and the guy will just be there on the floor. And you see it all the time in the education department, on the landings, um, before dinner, on association. I saw a guy, there was one time, because I used to play darts, I was playing darts. This was on D-Wing in Wayland, around about 2000 and... 2003 2004 and um it just kicked off you hear it you, you know you hear the energy and the noise and i turned round, and there was a little jamaican lad and it was a big black guy really sort of well-defined big built and he um he just kept hitting this jamaican just bang 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 like smashing him and um the little jamaican was just like throwing little punches at him um and then you just kind of, and this kind of went on for about 20 seconds all around the association room. And then you looked on the floor and the whole floor was just covered in blood because the little Jamaican was stabbing him with a pair of scissors. He wasn't punching him. He was stabbing him with a, a pair of scissors like that. Um, and he, he must have stabbed him about eight times. The whole floor was just covered in blood. And uh, sometimes in that situation, a prisoner will like press the bell. Um, it's generally not done, but when when something like that is that serious, because the officers are upstairs, you know, they're nowhere near. There's no cameras, um, so you can lose your life there. Um, knives, and I don't mean prison shanks. I mean proper knives, like the murder in Pentonville a year or two ago. Knives are becoming more and more common and being found in searches now in our prisons because the security is so weak and poor because the resources have been stretched. Big combat knives are getting into prison, onto the prison landing now, flick knives, switch blades, they're coming over the wall um, and, and, and people are, ca people are carry, uh, you know, have got access to these kind of weapons now. Um, but yeah, but Wayland, you, you just, you know, you, you don't see on the yard like the Catholics, the Christians, the Muslims, um, it's blacks, um, Muslims, whites, but they don't really stick together. They're just in their own sort of groups. Um, and you know, the Manchester guys will stick together. The Geordies will stick together. The Scousers, the Liverpool lads will stick together. Um, and yeah, that's just, that's just how it is. Uh, yeah. What's the second biggest gang after the Muslim gang then? Just you want to come forward a little bit again? Um, in blacks the black gang blacks yeah okay blacks. where i was housed number one cause of violence and murder debts usually drug debts mm -hmm. is it the same in the uk now is that what the violent causes the violence it's over drugs in the adult prisons yeah um i would say yeah debts money not paying debts um if if you don't pay a debt, then you're gonna you, you're gonna get smashed there. Yeah, you're gonna get smashed. You got you can't be not paying your debts if you owe people money. Um, but they, they can, violence can kick off anything really. Just for looking at someone the wrong way, yeah. just standing on someone in the dinner queue, going in front of somebody. Mm -hmm. If he's had a day from hell, um, you know, he and you push in front of him in the dinner queue, it it can just kick off straight away. Uh, noise yeah. at night, tell he's been too loud, like you were saying earlier. Um, but I would say the 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 main 
um, religion as well nowadays in 2018, mm. religion now, arguments over religion and stuff, um, offending people. Um, and everybody's different, you know, so we could be playing poker and I could uh, make a comment to you that you wouldn't find that offensive and you might just make, you know, a comment back to me. I could say that to somebody else mm -hmm. and they, 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 they could want to smash me for it. And, um, you know, so you, it, you've got to be careful what you say. Um, With your 13 years of prison experience, what would your advice, prison survival advice be to a newcomer to prison? I would recommend that they order a copy of 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene immediately. I've read that, yeah. Um, I would, I would, get the, I would um, recommend that they study that book. Um, it's Survival of the Fittest. I would recommend... Um, you have these, these general rules of advice that you'd say don't borrow... Don't double bubble anything. What does double bubble mean for the American people? So you you borrow some one item and then you pay two back. Two for one, three for one. Three yeah, for and then if you don't pay that, we then it's four. Um, and that's all well and good, but that's not really reality, Sean. Because when you get in there, you you might need something before, you know, a twenty pound postal order arrives, and you know you know the twenty pounds on the way, so you know you, you're going to need a bit of tobacco, or you might need a, you know, a, some shower gel or something. So. Um, but just, yeah, make sure you pay your debts. The I would give the same advice to somebody who was, from what I've seen, that is going into the American penitentiaries um, in the sense that I wouldn't talk to anybody. I would advise don't talk to anybody. Um, just observe. Just see who's who and what's what. When you come out, um, you know, I'd advise them not to... Um, isolate because then you'll be victimized so keep up appearances no matter how you're feeling i.e um like you say about the hygiene with in american prisons you have to shower however intimidating it is or frightening it is going into that steamed up room with all these guys big guys who you don't know um go in there every every opportunity you get like once a day three times a week go into the shower come out into the association room you don't have to play pool but just show your face um, even if you just stand there, you know, just show your face, keep up appearances, don't not come out for dinner and hide on association because you'll you'll become a target very quickly. Um, only talk to people if they talk to you. Um, don't try and start be over friendly because people will just start working angles on you and trying to um, you show weakness. They'll start trying to take things off you, um, get you to carry drugs. Um, intimidate you extort you so don't um don't reveal too much about yourself have your paperwork you know what you're in for um if you've got nothing to hide you shouldn't have a problem having your paperwork have your paperwork so if anyone asks you can you know say look i'm not here for harming a child or a woman or anything like that um and just um that would be the advice that that i would give in at this time in 2018 at the minute, why I said about the 48 Laws of Power is because where you've got, um, you know, in the American penitentiaries where it's um, extreme violence, gang rape, rape, uh, and all these, you know, horrific consequences of mass warehousing, um, which just breeds the distorted and entrenched criminal values that, that, that led to those people coming to prison in the first place and just makes them worse. Um, over in this country, even though there's a, there's a lot of violence in our prisons at the moment, um, it's there's a lot of psychological warfare in these prisons. People, it's the velvet glove um, from the people close to you. There's a, so much of that going on now. And it's that, unfortunately, at the minute is a consequence of this kind of um, carrot dangling design that they've made, that they've... Um, you, that they use now in our British prisons like you must be well behaved and then we'll give you this and we'll give you early home leave and you can come out earlier um, so it's it's there's the, the solidarity amongst men um, which is in my experience and opinion the one thing that gets you through these experiences the bonds that you've spoke about the bonds that you make with other men that you, you don't make with other people out here in the real world those you know those unbreakable bonds of togetherness and love and friendship um, with with another person um, that's kind of dying out and it's more every man for himself 
Um, 48 Laws of Power is actually banned in the Arizona Department of Corrections. Can you give any examples of strategies from that book that will be most relevant to prison? Um, so one of the laws is always say less than necessary um, because it's very easy to offend the wrong person. So if you're a chatterbox and you're, it's so easy to offend someone, you know, on a whole range of different subjects, um, you know, whatever, you know, politics, religion, football, um, you know, it's just so easy. And you might not, you know, everyone's different. You might not even know you've offended the person, but then they'll have a grudge now. Some people might react straight away and tell you you've offended them. Other people will, will, won't will say it and you won't even realize. And then, and then they'll have a grudge against you. Um, and, uh, but it would, yeah. So um, just keep your mouth shut and- um, Which other strategies? Um, It it I would read about um keep keeping your friends close. So you learn a lot about jealousy and envy. So envy um is a very ugly emotion. Um in the forty eight laws of power it documents the last three thousand years of history in the sense of all the most successful emperors, um and uh, uh, you know, Alexander the Great, all these people, how they were not only how they rose to power, but how they fell from power and it was always the people around them so even when you even in the modern age now when you at the uh, iraq war when you saw saddam hussein at his table talking to all his generals the guy i can't remember his name but the one who flew to america and gave them all the intelligence on saddam it's always the people around them that bring them down so um keep your enemies close um teaches you um about envy and you start to recognize envy in people close to you the people close to you are the ones most aroused to envy um, because they know a lot about you. Um, so um, envy will be displayed and they'll criticisms and it'll teach, you know, they start criticizing you for little things and it teaches you little tools and strategies to test if people are genuine. So if I wanted to test someone um, who I thought who I thought might have um, bad motives against me, I would throw out a comment. So I learned this in the 48 Laws of Power. I could throw out a comment that I know is going to um, offend them, right? Um, and if they just laugh it off and just treat it as banter, then I know that they're quite genuine. If they become really offended um, and lash out at me and become really angry, then I know that, um, that I need to be careful of them. And Ma Machiavelli says it, um, Lord, protect me. Um, from my friends, I know how to take care of my enemies because it's the ones close to you. Um, but there's loads of good stuff in in the 48 Laws of Power. And there's another one which was written by 50 Cent um, called the 50th Law, which is a smaller version. And it's his 50 Cent's uh, personal um, life journey with everything he went through, getting shot nine times and surviving on the street and then going into the music industry, which again is another cutthroat industry using Robert Greene's 48 Laws of Power strategies. Um, and, he, and he does like different rule, law, how he's applied the laws to his life. I remember being on a unit in Wayland on a therapy unit with 40 people on that unit, 36 actually, there was um, 18 downstairs and 18 upstairs. And I remember probably 10, 12 people all reading copies of The Art of War and 48 Laws of Power at any one time and there is a lot of um psychological warfare in psychological warfare in prison when you're battling to survive every day is very draining it's very confusing you don't know who to trust um it's all velvet glove um violence is rare um you know and it in, in, in the 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 guy that's screwed your parole up and put notes in the box saying you're he's dealing in contraband or tobacco, um, who's putting his arm around you when you've been caught and just lost your parole and consoling you, that's the guy who's done it to you. Um, so it's, 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 uh, that's, that's kind of how prison is now. It's don't outshine the master in that one. Cause like, you see people rising up in the gangs mm. and then they get egotistical and cocky. And then I saw some people get really humbled really fast and brutally because um, their egos got out of control and they thought they had more power than they really had. Mm. This gang's backing me. I can do whatever I want now. 
see anything like that. Don't outshine the master. Outshining the master is just so dangerous. Um, you know, w whether it's in prison, the workplace, wherever you are, outshining the master is is. Um, I used to see a lot of that in in kind of the group therapy kind of situations and um, where you're in the, like these groups and, you know, you have two counsellors or practitioners and the guy who's been there ages, who's a mentor and stuff like that, he starts thinking he's like a counsellor or a practitioner and he's outshining the master because he's, or if he's clever, there's a possibility that he could outshine the practitioner because some of the practitioners are not that experienced. So when he starts thinking that he and showing that he he's cleverer than the practitioner, um, he's creating an enemy in the practitioner, and that enemy has got the power to potentially influence release. And that, I would see that a lot. But um, yeah, it's a good one. Out, out, don't outshine the master. Very, very, very dangerous thing to do because the master will just eliminate you. Yeah. Because you become a threat to them. So if it's in a gang. Um, and you start, um, you know, trying to imitate and conduct yourself in the in, in the same manner as the head of the whites or the head of the blacks, but you're not the head, then you're going to become a, a big threat to them. Um, and they're, they're going to take you out. They're going to want to take you out. On the subject of Robert Greene, is it the art of seduction that he's written as well? There's a seduction book that he's done. The seduction book is called um, The Art of Seduction. Okay. There was a prisoner who read that. And he, he get, they kept moving him from yard to yard because every yard he went to, he was using techniques from that mm. book to seduce female staff members and he'd yeah. end up having sex with them. No matter where they put him, they'd move the female guard to a different yard, they'd put him on a, diff on a different yard and he, he'd just use the techniques on, on another woman and seduce her as well. Yeah. Did you see any, anything like that? Um, guards having sex with prisoners? Mm. Well, um, with regards to the art of seduction, the art of seduction is an extremely powerful book. Um, even you know where it warns you when you read the Forty Eight Laws of Power. It says once you've read this book, there isn't really any going back because it does become um, changes your worldview, doesn't it? A hundred percent, and a lot of it can become a working part of your mind, and it can affect your interpersonal relationships and friendships because you can become quite untrustworthy of people. But um, the art of seduction documents all the most successful um seduct seductors um of, of women um and it'll teach you all these like incredible um it teaches you how to make women fall in love with you um but it teaches you how to do it in a ruthless and brutal way and to never kind of attach to them um so if a woman if a woman says to you something like oh um when i was a little girl it always used to snow at, at my at my dad's house um and and there was um deers in the garden remember that and it's a really fond memory this the art of seduction will teach the person um to recreate that memory and put artificial snow around the house when she comes home from work get some deers snow gloves and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the woman's just like that like just falling in love with them and um but what, with regards to your question about so yeah it's a very 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 powerful book um the the with regards to your question about um guards having sex with inmates that is um going on i would probably say in nearly every single prison in england and wales at the moment um the figures for people officers getting suspended and dismissed for it um as well as bringing drugs in are probably three or four hundred every year um it's happening all the time and it, it's something that you never see with your own eyes it's something that you never see it's in the broom closet <laughs> and you know you, you sit there you're on these landings and you think like what how, how, where can you have sex with a female officer but it happens all the time it's going on big league um it, i think that it happens when the when they do the daily checks so they come in check the bell check the light um and all that kind of stuff i think it just happens then quick two minutes um and you do you do you only ever hear about it after the, is but they've been sacked or moved um or someone's got jealous and put a kite in yeah yeah the because that's it, our 48 laws isn't it as well to avoid those people 
Avoid. You've got you've got something good going on. They're going to sabotage it. Yeah, yeah. Avoid the the the, the unlucky and the miserable or something. The, 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 they just um, drain all your positive energy from you, and they do. It's true. Um, who you have around you is very important. Um, Where I was at in the first year in the county jail, Towers Jail, medium security. Mm. There was a youngster in there. When I say youngster, maybe about twenty or so, and. My one of my co defendants, Joey Crack, was a cellmate with him. And he said, Look, youngsters seduced this guy. And this guy was beautiful brunette. And I was like, No way, no way. And goes, Well, tonight after lockdown, watch the fishbowl because he dances naked for her at the front of the cell yeah. when no one else can see. And she, you'll see her smiling at him. Yeah. And I did. And um, he, he was. And. Um, they were getting together and stuff like she get him out to do cleaning duties and take him away where no one could see. Yeah. But cause word got out, people are like, well, if he's getting some, why aren't I getting some? Well, if, he, if I'm going to get him out of the way and, and, and try and try and play on myself, that was the attitude. Or I'm mm -hmm. just going to spoil this for him because I can't get any. That's the attitude of some people. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a situation where well, I think once it's happened, it's never going to end well because other people will find out, people will get jealous and um, notes will go in boxes. And um, it's just a recent one in Winchester. The lady um, was um, having sex with him. Then she got moved to another unit. Um, it was in the newspaper recently. She got moved to another unit. But even when she got moved to the other unit, she was still sending her underwear and photos of herself um, to a male officer to give to this guy. God bless her. Um, but yeah, but they get uh, they get they fall pregnant. Um, they leave. Sometimes they stay together. Um, what do you think motivates female staff to have relations with prisoners? It's it's a difficult one, Sean, because it's a bit of a mystery. Um, I. Regards to um, from the male, the prisoner perspective, I think it's money and greed because they they kind of manipulate them um, and then they're getting them to bring ounces of heroin in. Yeah, they um, seduce them to bring the drugs in. That's a, that's a big thing. Yeah, I think from the female perspective, uh, it's difficult. I, I would say that um, no matter how much training. Because even though the the training's minimal, it's a few weeks up in the Midlands, and they teach you how to cut someone down from a noose, and that's about it, and fold fold you up on the floor. But um, you can't um, prevent human chemistry, and I think the only way a female officer would ever be interested in you as a male prisoner is if she likes you. I don't think I don't think you can. Um, I think it's very very difficult uh, to to if they're not interested in you to seduce them. Um, the art of seduction says any woman who is not happy can be seduced. So maybe I'm wrong, but I think the women who end up in sexual relationships with prisoners in this country happens because she likes them. But then men are terrible at reading signals. Men are terrible at reading the signals that a woman would um, show that she's interested where she reveals her wrists and strokes her hair and her neck and touches here and all this kind of stuff like I would notice that stuff I'll be over the moon if a female guard would show me them signals or an education a, a pretty education lady or um, but uh, I yeah I think you can't stop human chemistry um, I think that um, the art of seduction teaches you that naturally as human beings we want what we can't have um so there's probably an element of that going on because it's wrong it's taboo um and and it just it just happens and i think it happens quickly um people in prison are manipulative um so maybe it's a combination of the the chemistry and the manipulation and um but this 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 garden winchester i mean there'd be no drugs on the wing She'd be off for a week. She'd come on duty and then the whole wing would be flooded with heroin. And she, and then like all the lads are coming back from the gym with all their tops off and she's there and they're all like hovering like flies around them. And if you're a prison officer who's been there 25 years, you're going to clock that straight away, yeah, aren't yeah. you? You're going to just clock it immediately. Um, One of the things I noticed is a lot of these prisons across America now built in these like, out of the city towns, they create a lot of employment. 
these women come in from these towns, they've not had much attention from men. Mm. And they get into the prison system, like you said, the manipulation, the flattery. They, you know, these some of these guys who've read these books and know these techniques seduce them using mm -hmm. using this, and because um, they've not had heard people saying these kind of words to them before, mm. then it, it it goes to the head, and and then they get you know brainwashed into bringing drugs in and stuff like that. Yeah, I think there's a lot of that going on. Yeah. So you mentioned Fifty Cent. Mm. There's a rapper right now, topping the Billboard charts. Who's in prison? Six by nine. Six nine, yeah. yeah to I've catch been watching the videos. Yeah. yeah, are you familiar with him at all? I've only started watching his YouTube music videos after I saw him on your podcasts. What would have happened if a rainbow herd, skinny, half Puerto Rican, half Mexican kid ended up in a UK prison? Um, I've not done this one on YouTube yet. I don't know. I don't know. It's, a, it's a tricky one. I think. It, all the prison, prisons are different or it depends where he was. I think if he went into a London prison, um, he'd probably just get terrorized. Um, he would, he would be, you know, because he's, he's kind of asking for it the way his hair, um, you know, he, the, the tattoos, he's got 69 written on his, on his face. Um, he, he, he might, um, if he's streetwise, he might survive if he keeps his mouth shut. Um, you know, it's not over, too over familiar with people, but I don't, who knows really, um, anything can happen. Um, there has been in this country when um, s certain, um, like the, when So Solid crew were around in the garage scene, um, you know, when those, one or two of those went to prison, um, they didn't have a good time. Um, um, they get extorted. Well, G-Man, who was Lisa Mafia's um, boyfriend, he was next door to me on D-Wing in Wayland. He was a lovely, lovely fella, but he didn't used to come out of his cell a lot. And I used to say, look, come and play pool, mate. And he'd be like, no, nah, there's nothing for me out there. And he, he he wouldn't. So I don't know if he had had a bad experience when he first came in. I know Asher D, who got caught with a firearm, um, who was being extorted and got kidnapped outside in in London. That's why he got had the gun for protection. He didn't have a good time when he went in prison. Um, and it, but you've got you've got other guys who've been fine. Like uh, there's a rapper at the minute. Um, oh, what's his name? Um, he's just he's just finished the IPP sentence. Done a few years, um, and. Uh, he 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 was fine, and they just done his music thing. Um, I think it comes down to the individual and um, and how kind of streetwise they are to be able to survive in in them environments. Well, Takashi Six Nine has got weapons charges. He's got a federal case now, but prior to the federal case, he signed a plea bargain admitting guilt for sexual misconduct with a minor. Yeah. I so the thirteen-year-old. So with a sex a fence jacket coming into a London prison. Mm. What would happen to him then? Um, London pr prisons are quite bad with that kind of stuff. I mean, um, sex offenders, high profile sex offenders. So he would be high profile because uh, he'd done a video with the 13 year old and the oral sex and stuff like that. And he's posted it on Instagram. Um, but um, I mean, high profile sex offenders can get attacked immediately as soon as they come into the prison. Um, so, for example, when I was in um, Winchester prison, the the main suspect in the Lucy McHugh murder, which is a recent murder, um, where she got found with multiple stab wounds in Southampton, um, we knew he was in the police station away, um, being interviewed, and we knew he was going to come into Winchester pris prison. And I worked in reception with my friend Stuart. Um, and we both worked in there with a couple other guys off A-Wing and we were like orderlies and I was a Samaritans listener. Um, so I talked to people who were suicidal and then you had the officers in there and um, the, the I, I knew, I, we were anticipating his, his arrival into the prison, but when I walked in to the reception that night to go to work, I it was just the last thing on my mind. And as soon as I walked in there, the energy in this room is like something I've never experienced before and probably won't ever again, because um, it was at that time, 
a few months ago, probably the highest profile potential child sex murder in the country. And um, and my friend Stuart, um, who's actually, he's like a really friendly fella, but he's covered in tattoos all over his face. Um, and he looks like really scary. And um, he said, look, look, look. Uh, murder and rape uh, and it was him it was this this lad um, this suspect there's a couple of prison officers said to me uh, I'm going because I don't trust myself that's the guards you know very experienced officers um, who I do actually hold in the highest regard um, they were good to me um, really great officers um, Dan Brookfield Simon Parrish you know really really good men um, but this this guy had just brought in this sort of karma, this you know it, it, you know and an effect a crime that had hit the community of Southampton really hard, um, and a lot of these officers are from Southampton. Um, so a couple of officers just said to us, "Look," and there is no way on earth we thought they were going to bring him anywhere near us. And then what happened was, um, it, you know, he the lady came in and said. I'm going to bring him in. So we had our own little orderly room where we'd all sit and eat together and stuff. And um, she said, I'm sending him in. And I only want two people in here, you, because you're the listener, which is me, and one other person. So she kicked everyone out. And they brought this 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 guy, Stephen, into the room. Um, and he walked in and sat down. And um, he hadn't. He has been charged with murder and rape now and sexual activity with a child. But at the time, they charged him with not giving up his Facebook password and they had to go to America to um, Zuckerberg to get to get the the password because he wouldn't give him the password. Um, so he don't. He hadn't been charged with that. And innocent until proven guilty in this country is a fundamental aspect of our justice system. But you know, in the prison, he's the number one suspect. So. Um, you know, he's going to get smashed. Um, he's come in and I, I, this experience was so surreal. Um, I just would never expect him to be sitting. And I looked him right in the eye and I, I looked in his eye and I thought, is, am I looking into the eyes of a child killer or is this guy innocent? Um, and I honestly didn't really know at the time. He was trembling like this, terrified. And the officers just left. And there is no way on this earth. And Stuart with the tattoos on his face, he came back and just stood in the door and he was going, we've got another Ian Huntley. We've got another Ian Huntley. So for the American viewers, Ian Huntley is a notorious double child killer who killed two 10 and 11 year old girls in Cambridge um, in 2003, 2002. And so Stu was saying, we've got another, um, he was taunting him saying, we've got another Huntley. And the guy was trembling like that. And, um, there's no way on earth that the highest profile potential child sex killer in the country over the pa all the pages of the newspaper was in here in this room and then all the officers just like forgot about him and um it was just really weird it felt like they like left him in there with us to do something and i had my parole in like two weeks but there was so much going through my mind i, I thought about attacking him i thought my chest was thumping. Um, it was just really crazy experience. And um, he, 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 the, the the other orderly just said to him, "Look, go and fucking hang yourself, mate." That's what he said to him, and just threw threw the book about the prison in his face. And he went out. He went to the healthcare unit. He's now been charged. And I asked a prison officer about him. Um, I, I said to him, "Like, did did they leave? Did they want us to?" He he, he said, "Ad." He, he said, "Look," he said, "You've got." Um, he said, we're all on our own journey in life, in the universe and the stars. He said, he'll walk around the corner one day and someone is just going to stick him in the throat. Um, and that's what's going to happen to him. And um, But I think what my point was that if he was in a London prison, I think it'd have been attacked immediately. The, the, the bomber, um, the so-called Islamic State inspired bomber, the 18 year old from Golders Green, I think it was, he was cut as soon as, as w within a couple hours of going into the prison. So I think in a London prison, if that kid had been there, I think he'd have got smashed immediately um, because those kind of high profile sex crimes, terrorist offences, um, the Lee Rigby killers, um, they got smashed by I the- saw the picture of them. They got smashed they by the They ran over a soldier, didn't they? They ran him, ran him over, beheaded him with a machete. On the streets of London. Yeah, in in, in um, 
in South London, yeah. Wow. And they got smashed right away. He looked like by the his teeth knocked out or something by, by the, the guards. officers in Belmarsh High Security yeah. Prison, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So you've watched you said you've watched Raving Arizona, my, yeah. my documentary. What did you think of that? I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was um yeah, just uh just you're talking about your own experiences, you're talking about um how you uh, went over there um, to do the stock broken and then you you know you got into this ecstasy thing and I can make this amount of money compared to that amount of money for this less work um, so yeah fuck it I'm gonna do this um, yeah I was just gripped by it really just the storytelling of it and um, you know to the, when it got to the point with Sammy the bull um, and the mafia are there and there's you know telling you you know look work for us um and and then you said on the on the on the video you know this is i'm now dealing with the mafia um and it was just great because you 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 you're showing how you're in this situation um which is all of your own making but then it's it's got you know quite heavy and you're in it and there's not much you can really do about it now and you've got these mafia guys you know, saying to you, do you know who I fucking work for? I work for Sammy the Bull. And then you'd said, you know, I'd already read about this guy and who he was and that he'd been um, implicated in, you know, two, a couple of dozen murders. And um, and then you you did what you can't do. You said to them, no, I'm, I'm all right. I'm going to stick with my guy. I'm not going to work for you. And then he just smiled and then, as per the mafia's, um, you know, MO, they attacked your guy, knocked his teeth out. Yeah. Intimidation, that's how they roll. That's, you know, murder and intimidation. That's what they do. So they're sending you a message there. And um, yeah, it just made me think of, um, it was interesting watching the video because that, that for me was a pinnacle of your story in the sense that that was a crossroads for you where if you would have agreed you'd have then been working with, working for, dealing with the American Italian mafia. Um, and you, you know, who knows where that would have ended up. It could have ended up successful, but maybe it could have ended up with you actually doing the 200 years. It could have ended up with you dead. Um, um, and you made, you said the decision no, and you were like, fuck it, I'm getting out of here. Um, and then you got the shotgun and then your um, mum and dad, they mm. saw you with the shotgun mm. and then you, you blagged it. You said, oh, it's, everyone's got a gun in America. Uh, and uh, yeah, just, yeah, really, I've been sending it to all my friends and stuff saying, check, you know, check this video. It's brilliant. Yeah, it's back up on YouTube right now. If anyone wants to watch it, Nat Geo took it down for copyright. We're just putting Raving Arizona. It's 45 minute documentary cliffhangers. And towards the end of the documentary, it showed I was at another crossroads, you know, in the jail. And I decided to start helping the prisoners. And one of the things I did was my writing was smuggled out, got put on the internet as a blog. And you said that partial inspiration came for your blog from what I've done. IPP Diaries mm -hmm. is your blog now. And you've got your YouTube channel out. Now, you, you've only been released when? I got released on the 20th of August. So you've only been out for, uh, how many months is that? Three? Four, four, four You've only been out for four yeah. months, done a total of 13 years in prison. What has changed in your brain? What's clicked now to make you become an activist and not want to go back to robbing houses with machetes? Um, well, I, I got a lot of help when I was in Wayland in 2000, uh, I was there for five years, um, between 2006, 2007, got released from there 2011. Um, I got released on a life license because I received an indeterminate sentence, an IPP sentence yeah. in 2006, got released in 2011, and I was out for six years, but then I got recalled for breaching my license. Yeah. Um, so that's my last term of imprisonment, two years on recall um, in Winchester prison. But the help that I received, um, therapy really, I, I went on a journey of group therapy, self-reflection, 
um i used to what they made me do they just gave me an opportunity to do something that i'd never been i'd never done before in prison which was they gave me an opportunity to write down about my life they asked me to write down about my life and then read it out in the group um and that's what i did and that for me was um a, a really uh it just cleansed me it was like i was reborn um but it was very difficult to do it required a lot of courage um and it brought me right in touch with with the the, the guilt and the shame that i've had about committing offenses um the issues from my past um drug addiction it woke me up to and helped me to understand drug addiction because i never understood it before you're not tempted to go back no 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 not temp not tempted to go back i don't drink alcohol i smoke um i go swimming every day oh i love swimming though yeah but i don't drink alcohol or take drugs um but um the, the thing is i believe desistance from crime is a process and not an event so it was all well and good me getting that help but then to throw you out the gate with 40 quid and say get on with it you know that you know that that then it kind of undermines all the hard work from those people and that from those professionals that helped me and that those professionals that helped me were from an organization called wrapped which is now called the forward trust and they even their funding's been cut mm. um in our prisons now but they they were fantastic they're very good counselors practitioners and they nursed me back to good spiritual and good psychological health with with love mm. um and I think that's important because for as long as we continue to demonize people, mm. which is what we do in this country, which they don't do in countries on the continent with low recidivism, um, then the opportunity for understanding and the opportunity for rehabilitation um, is, is gone, really. Um, so that, that they they never demonized me. They never judged me. They made me feel um, that I could talk about stuff and... Um, that that was the the key thing, um, but it brought me to my knees. That journey of self discovery and self reflection. Um, you know, he who looks inside awakens. He looks at who looks outside dreams. It was that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and the a lot of people couldn't hack it on there. Um, they would leave the therapy because the more they would look into themselves, the more difficult it would be, and the more painful it would be guys had been sexually abused they they just couldn't open up about it and they just re carried on suffering and self-harming and abusing drugs and all that kind of um avoidance yeah kind of um you know trauma kind of related stuff so i had six good years when i was out um but the the, the way i could specifically answer your question is 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 to say that there is no rehabilitation in our prisons in England and Wales, in my opinion. We've got the highest recidivism figures for young offenders, 86%. We create criminals. Our young offenders institutions at this moment in time in 2018 in modern Britain are not rehabilitating people. They are creating the next killers, the next rapists, the next child molesters, the next burglars, and they are they are schools for uh, criminality and make them into hardened criminals. Um, and that's what's going on. The saving grace in my journey over the past few years where I've stayed out of trouble is the people I've met, Sean, mm. people who have been willing to give me an opportunity. Yeah. I worked for Rick Stein. He gave me an opportunity, world-renowned chef, mm -hmm. um, a string of convictions. He employed me. I've worked for Miller and Carter. I was a head waiter there. Yeah. Um, I, the first job I had after I came out from those years of IPP imprisonment was was um, in a family-run hotel, a mm -hmm. family called the Coopers from Birmingham, which is in the Midlands. Mm -hmm. um, they knew about my background. Um, all I needed was a national insurance number and someone willing to give me an opportunity. And they gave me an opportunity to run their hotel in the nighttime. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the people, it's the people that I've met um, that have had faith in me and believed in me and said and and, and made me feel that I can I can create a a happy life for myself, a successful life, and uh, away from um, criminality and drugs. There are some good people out there. What's your living situation now? I'm living in a approved premises probation hostel. 
um, with mainly paedophiles. I'm on a curfew. I'll get rigorous drug testing, alcohol testing, room searches. Um, so not the best, unfortunately. Are you trying to make a move? Yeah, I'm going to be moving out of there soon, going to London, yeah. What's, what's it going to take to get you this, to um, get the move? Um, where it's all set up. Um, again, it's this that organization I told you about, RAP, who's yeah. now the form, Forward Trust. Um, they're the ones helping me. If I if I didn't have them, I'd be screwed. Wow, Sean. good job, RAP. I'd be screwed, honestly. Yeah. Um, so I've got they're just an amazing people. Uh, the guys who work for RAP, they're absolutely brilliant. Um, they're the leading um, deliverer of drug and alcohol programs within the prison estate. But over the past few years, they've just strip them down and strip them down. So what they've had to do is merge with Blue Blue Sky, um, which was a community based um, like charity. So they've merged to make the Forward Trust, and then now they they're helping me with employment. They're helping me with college. They'll help me with university. They'll help. They're giving, helping me with housing. Um, all that kind of stuff. Is there any help that the people watching this video could give for you? Is there anything? You know, I'm going to have people support your IPP Diaries blog. Um, we'll have people subscribe to your Crime and Justice TV mm -hmm. uh, channel on YouTube. We'll put those links in below the description box. Is there anything you'd like to say to the people watching this um, in conclusion? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure for having the opportunity to... Um, to to be here with you, Sean, and to um, talk to your um, viewers in America um, and in, in in the UK and anywhere else. Some of my viewers out there might be young people thinking about doing the things you've done. Um, yeah, I mean, to to young kids who are um, thinking about or who are already in, involved in crime, um, it 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 will destroy your life. Um, it'll destroy your relationships with your family. It will um, destroy, it will strip you of everything, um, all your dignity, your self-respect, your self-esteem. Um, and, you know, you, you, you are in control of your life in the sense that, and what I mean by that, um, all the things I've said about the young offenders institutions in, in the UK, these young lads, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, the frightening thing is that these lads that I knew in these prisons, some of these people have just had the most incredible potential. The best football, so waste of talent. the best footballers I've ever played with have been in prison, uh, mainly young black lads from London, the best musical artists, the best um, painters I've ever met have been in prison. I'd even go as far to say that... Um, that you you've got people in there could be scientists physicists um you know it's never too late to 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 kind of um if you have gone down the wrong road to get back on track um and it, getting an education is just so important to get yourself an education if you've dropped out of school or college um you can always go back um if you've if you've from you know over in this country um so many of these lads in these young prison, young offenders prisons have been sexually abused or been in care or from dysfunctional backgrounds over probably 60 70 percent have been in the care system um you know so if if you've got if you're fr if if you're in that if you're if that's your world and that's your life um you know and you don't have that guidance around you and you don't have you know a strong positive family influence around you then you unfortunately you have to just grow up quick with your 14 15 16 you have to grow up quick because no one else is going to look after you or take care of you so, so just you know study read books get yourself an education and um and and that will give you that will give you a future and if you go down that road instead of the other road that i've been talking about you can have a life beyond your wildest dreams um you can fulfill your potential, you can be happy, you can have children, you can have a career, and you can make a difference in the world. And it's never too late to change, you know, even if you're a bit older in your 20s, if you've already been to prison, you know, um, not many people escape the revolving door of the American penitentiary system or the UK prison system. Not, 
you know, uh, it, it, not many people escape it. So it, it, if you've only been, if you've been in there once or twice, you, you have got a chance um, to, to break away from it. Um, but you, you have to grow up quick. And if you haven't got that strong influence around you, then you need to just take responsibility and do it yourself. That's what I'd say. So if you're at that crossroads, thinking about doing the things that me and Pepsi got up to, you're going to have to uh, not want to end up in these places where you're going to get tortured by guards, pushed to the brink of suicide. I was on the brink of suicide in my experience as well. Just thought, I can't take this anymore. Just going to slash my wrists and bleed out. Seeing people get stabbed around you, blood just squirting out. You know, the nightmares, the trauma you're going to have for the rest of your life. I think that's a real... Um, positive message that Pepsi's ended this podcast on there for young people thinking about going down these roads. It's just not worth the excitement. It's not worth the fast cash. At the end of the day, you know, all that wasted talent in prison, those people could have been out there employing their energy positively and thriving in life. But instead, you know, the things that we that tripped us up, the fast cash, the excitement, the getting high, the just being anti, mainstream society, all that stuff that you think is cool. At the end of the day, there's a huge price for it. And most of this podcast today, Pepsi has described the price he's paid, you know, for his actions and he's he took responsibility. And I, I just wish you the best, man, just um, rebuilding your life. And I really appreciate you coming on. So um, oh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, give me, give me a hug. Cheers, mate. Yeah, cheers.